Yeah, let's do uh, housekeeping and and then roll if we can, just to get the quorum in. Welcome everyone to today's um, Legal Services Trust Fund um, Commission meeting. Uh, we're gonna go through all uh, the tech protocols. I'll hand it over to the staff, Erica, I believe is doing yep. it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, welcome commission members, liaisons and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meeting. We're using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you'd like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raised hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad to raise your hand and do the same to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you'd like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. Please note that all Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meetings are recorded and posted to the State Bar website. So friendly reminder that this is a video conference and please be aware of your surroundings behind you. <clears throat> Zoom captioning is available to enable select live transcript at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then select enable auto transcription. Um, some troubleshooting tips for those using Zoom on a computer. When you're on mute, holding down the space bar will allow you to temporarily unmute yourself. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. And while joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you, Erica. Um, okay. Chris, would you like me to do roll call right now? Yeah, uh, yes, please. Thanks, Erica. Great. Asaraf? Connolly? Aglogi? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? A present. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Here. Iskin? Here. King? Judge Klein? Here. Cruz? Cruz? Lee? Lee? Mahoney? Here. Meeker? Here. Milrod? Present. Vargas? Schreiber? Here. Justice Rodriguez? Here. Judge Seligman? Judge Seligman? Judge Yang? Judge Yang? We have quorum, Chris. I'll do the liaisons and staff. Copeland, Selena? Lauren, Brown. Brian, Selena today. Oh, hi, hi Lauren. Brown? Here. Snyder? State Bar staff, I saw Elizabeth. Brady, are you on? I am. Great. And Erica's on. Okay, great. I'll turn it back over to you, Chris. All right, thanks, Juan. Uh, so thanks everybody for being here. Nice to see everybody. I think our next meeting is going to be in person in June. And so there'll be some of us together in person, others on Zoom, but I'll look forward to that and seeing y'all uh, at the at the dawn of summer. And um, but for today, we've got a full agenda. And um, I'm going to do a couple things first. Uh, one, we have two new commissioners here, uh, and you'll get a chance to to meet them because I'm going to put them on the spot and ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, Ephraim and Patience, uh, I'll let you go in that order, let's say, and why don't you just tell us um, where, uh, where you're from, how you ended up on the commission. Um, I'll just note Ephraim is, uh, is an assembly appointment and a patient's is a judicial counsel appointment. And we've had a chance to chat. And so I'm happy to hear from you and uh, introduce and tell us some good news as well. How's that? 
Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Chris, I'll think about what good news. There's lots of good news, but uh, again, Efrain Escobedo, it's it's uh, truly a pleasure to be a part of the commission. Look forward to getting to know all of you and, and serving together. Uh, I reside currently in Los Angeles County, specifically in the city of Pomona. I was born and raised in the LA County region. Uh, I currently serve as president and CEO of the Center for Nonprofit Management. My background is in nonprofit uh, government and philanthropy. So most recently, I did an eight-year tenure at the California Community Foundation, uh, where I worked on uh, issues related to uh, immigration, education, and civic engagement. And so my interest and uh, excitement to serve on the commission comes out of understanding the power uh, that um, public-private partnerships and grant funding uh, can leverage for the benefit of communities, particularly more indigent communities. So I've done a lot of grant making uh, with legal service providers and community organizations, particularly serving immigrant communities. So it's a pleasure to be here and look forward to getting to know all of you. Great, thank you. My name is Patience Milrod. I am um, I'm in Fresno. Uh, I started life as a VISTA lawyer. so. You could say I'm a legal aid lifer in a way. Um, I did take a 30 year hiatus to be in private practice and do civil rights work and death penalty defense and whatnot. And went back to grad school and then spent five years ending last June um, as the executive director of Central California Legal Services. So um, I was your customer in a way. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to learning about how this process works from uh, from your side, and I I appreciate uh, the way that you've that you've kept our program afloat along with all of our sister programs over some very difficult times over the last few years. Um, so, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, and and I look forward to working with you. Well, it's great to have you both. Um, and again, we have another uh, a, another diverse um, appointment set here in terms of not only geography, but also background. We've got a lawyer that is accustomed to being on the receiving end of file to funds, and then someone with a nonprofit and grant making background who's not a lawyer. And, you know, this sort of is rounding out our, our commission at the moment in this sort of really terrific mixed way. And I'm really um, excited about the vitality we won't do a sort of go round this time, um, which maybe will make me sad, but others happy. So, um, and uh, but you will have a chance to meet everybody, and and at some point, uh, hopefully, we'll be together in person with you both. So we're gonna dig in, and I think just first uh, quarter business is call for public comment. I don't know if anybody's here that wants to comment but I'll let staff let me know whether somebody's there. Chris, there is a person um, that has their hand raised. Um, okay. I just would note, um, uh, go ahead and identify yourself if you would, please. And uh, I'm going to limit public comments to three minutes. And also just to let you know, it, there may be an opportunity on specific agenda items um, if for, for the public to comment as well. And would the staff mind unmuting? the member of the public. Good morning, everyone. Uh, commissioners, my name is Cindy Panuco. I am the Vice President and Chief Programs Officer at Public Council. I oversee our legal programs and on the call as well as Joshua Hirsch, our Director of Grants. And I just wanted to make uh, the commissioners aware that we are on the call and available to answer any questions during the Public Council related agenda items. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Cindy. I appreciate that. And thanks for being here today um, and sort of at the ready. And we we will let you know. Uh, anyone else, staff? On I, the... I don't see anybody else. Okay. Uh, let's just start uh, chopping some wood here. First order of business, can we get approval of the uh, meeting minutes from the December 13th meeting? 
Um, and just before you go there, just a note for the new yeah. commissioners, even if you were, didn't attend at the last commission meeting, um, you weren't present or you weren't on the commission yet, you can still, you may still vote yes. It's a like a vote of confidence for your colleagues. Uh, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move. I'll second. That was Eric and Bonham Shane. Yes. Eric and Bonham Shane. Okay. Fire away on the roll call. Great. Asaraf? Connolly? Aglagi? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yeah. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. King? Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Vargas, Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, we'll move on to the next item. Uh, this is uh, number 4.1, which is a report from me. And I just have one item, which is uh, a reminder uh, and a nice reminder today that since we have two new commissioners, that we need to step up our recruiting efforts. So we have several uh, appointments and positions opening up over the course of the next 12 months. I think Duan can share a screen with sort of everybody's terms, including my own after 10 years, I'll be terming off uh, this year. And so we were, we're gonna need to just make sure that we are doing our outreach uh, and doing our level best to fill our spots. So this is really just a call for all of us to help find people to, to fill this important job. And if you can uh, do that, please forward names to uh, staff uh, so that they can reach out, explain what the job entails. And again, I'm happy to serve as a resource in that regard also. Uh, but Juan, do you want to share your screen? Sure, or... sure. Um, and just before I share, I had emailed everybody um, earlier this week um, the existing rosters so that you can see your term end date. We triple checked it, so I'm pretty confident it's accurate. But if you do see something that seems off or you know it's incorrect, please let me know so that we can make sure we'll go back and look at your appointments letter and make sure that it's 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 correct and and, and do that double check. Um, and I mentioned in the the email um, that there are a number of both. Um, state bar appointments. The commission itself has one appointment um, as well as the assembly. So with that, let me share. Great. Um, and Chris asked me to go through this exercise just that we're all, so all on the same page and nobody is surprised that they'll be terming off. Um, so you'll see right now, um, there are uh, one, two, three, four members from um, the commission terming off on the state bar board of trustees appointments. Um, only three of them will actually be, um, will stay um, state bar board of trustees appointment. The other one will get converted to a trust fund com commission appointment just in light of SB um, 211. Um, so Chris, Amin, Will, and Jim are, are all terming off. Um, on the trust fund commission hey, when, itself, when you just said they, they're converting, so when you say that are they all actually terming off or? They're all, they're all terming off, but their open position it doesn't remain. Three three of those four open positions will remain a state bar board of trustee. And one of them, I'm sorry, will, will be converted to a legal services trust fund commission appointee. Sorry, I wasn't clear on that. Thank you. But that's spot will, not that person. That spot will, not the person. Exactly. The spot will. Um, for the commission app appointment itself, um, there will be uh, the one the one open spot that's pulled from from the, the state bar board of trustees and it will be a client eligible position. And then on the judicial council side, it, um, there's one opening and sadly Bonache is terming off. Um, and then the last opening we have is the last open um, uh, assembly um, member that we you know, 
Efren, maybe you can help us um, with, with the recruitment work for that or letting us know how, how we, if we have people that we know that might be interested because we actually don't have visibility into um, the, the Senate appointment and uh, the assembly appointment. For the other kind of three appointing authority, we are, we rerun, the, obviously the commission runs its, its appointment, its own appointment, but it goes through like the staff here at the state bar, as well as the board of trustees. Judicial council goes through judicial council, but Melian and I coordinate very closely on those appointments. We don't have actually a line of communication right now um, with the Senate and the assembly. So there is one. Um, so maybe, you know, the, the, the Senate and the assembly, um, appoint, appointees can help us with that. Nobody should take the, uh, strike through their name, uh, you know, as anything personal. <laughs> um, well, you can always, you can good. reapply, you can reapply. As I mentioned, my, yeah. email, if you're interested in reapplying, <laughs> um, what we encourage you to do, um, to maximize your chance is submit an application through, um, the state bar website that, that the state bar website will go that will then be considered by both the board of trustees and the commission and then also submit an application to the judicial council so then you're hitting three appointing entities in two application okay great thanks Tuan. and and um for the new members you know it's it's a great way to start building a you know long-term relationships which i i certainly um can testify to and uh, they're great um, thoughtful people that have been on this commission over the years. And so I'm happy to be uh, in their company. Okay, um, next, I think we've got uh, a, a little bit of a, a short report from uh, Juan and Elizabeth and Rocio. Where are yes. you, Rocio? Um, so, there you are. So hey. My big announcement is that our office has restructured slightly. As you all know, our grants work has tripled in size in the last few years. Um, our staffing has also tripled in size. We're approaching 22 staff members and we might sur be surpassing that in 2024. So in light of the kind of those changes and recognition of the important work of both on the policy side and diversity and access inclusion, um, and also the grant side needing to kind of solidify the infrastructure, we've decided to hire a third program director in our office who will oversee all the grants. So I'm really pleased to reintroduce you to Rocio Avalos. Um, Rocio, three years ago, was in this office during grants work. Um, she also um, helped heavily with the justice gap study. So we're, we're just so pleased um, to have her back in this new new position. Um, Rocio, would you like to share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Rocio Avalos, as Duan mentioned, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's really great to see a lot of familiar faces and looking forward to meeting those I haven't yet worked with and excited to be part of this team. Um, again, helping to support the commission and the work of the Office of Access and Inclusion. Um, as Duan mentioned, I was um, previously in this office as a senior program analyst. Um, I then um, left for a few years during the pandemic um, and was uh, the director of people and operations at a nonprofit in the philanthropic sector called Hispanics and Philanthropy. Um, also a grant making organization focused on leveraging resources for um, Latinx communities throughout the Americas. And prior to that, a lot of my background is in nonprofits. Um, previously um, worked at Amnesty International for about eight years and a little bit in, um, in politics, but very excited to be back at the Office of Access and Inclusion and um, supporting our grant work. Thank you. And our hope for um, Rocia's position is that because it, you know we have so many different types of grants that she'll really um, come in, streamline all our processes, all our protocols, make sure the qu the quality that has been there is still going to be continuing, um, and then also be your main kind of staff support. But you'll see a lot of Rocio in the upcoming commission meetings, providing kind of a grants administration um, update, working with the fiscal team to provide you all with an IELTS revenue update, um, being an extra kind of pair of hands and support for the commission as well. But I, my, my position is gonna be changing a little bit and that I'm gonna lean into the kind of the access work and the policy work alongside with Elizabeth a little bit more, um, but having Rocio will free up our time to kind of do the other half of our office. Welcome okay. back. Um, and I'm going to hand it over now to Elizabeth, who's going to give you um, a, an update on the diversity inclusion work in our office. 
Hi, everyone. Um, Elizabeth Hom, Program Director in our office. So I just uh, wanted to bring to your attention quickly that um, the State Bar submits a diversity, equity, and inclusion plan to the legislature every other year. Um, and this report um, uh, documents the progress we've made over the last two years and describes future plans. Um, as you all know, uh, the staff in the Office of Access and Inclusion have mixed portfolios of work. So many of the staff that you work with very closely on grants also contribute to projects, initiatives, uh, related to um, DEI, like um, law school retention and LRAP. Um, and so I want to let you know that the report is posted on the State Bar's website. We had we just submitted it to the legislature on March 15th. Um, and I uh, really encourage all of you to take a look at it um, as a lot of the work that we're doing on the DEI side, I think, um, could inform a lot of the work that we're doing on grants administration. Um, so uh, we can also send out the link to you, but I just wanted to flag that for you today. Thank you. Yep, please send it out. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, next on the hit parade, Brady, five minutes on um, Form 700. Let's, where'd you go? I am here. There you are. There you are. Okay. Take it um, away. I'm going to share a screen just uh, in case I need to uh, quote any um, statutory text here. Brady, can you do a brief introduction of yourself for, for our new commissioners? Oh, sure. We'll be seeing a lot of you. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Brady Dewar. I'm an uh, assistant general counsel in the um, State Bar's Office of General Counsel. We're sort of the in-house in counsel for the organization. I do a little bit of everything, litigation, um, um, policy work, advising the Board of Trustees, um, and um, near and dear to my heart for the last uh, Almost five years now, I've been working um, with the Office of Access and Inclusion, including especially the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. So um, I um, uh, review um, many or most of our agenda items. I'm um, here, or my colleague um, Raul, um, um, for, for most, uh, pretty much all the commission meetings and, and most committee meetings um, um, to answer legal questions um, as they come up to make sure that we are um, um, you know, uh, in compliance with our various governing authorities. And I'm a resource, uh, me and our entire office, um, 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 for all of you. Um, and uh, uh, today I'm here actually just to um, hopefully provide some clarity and answer any questions you might have um, about the Form 700 reporting. Um, you should have all received an email um, um, with instructions and a link to net file to um, file your annual Form 700 statements. Um, for the two of you who are new, Hopefully um, you have received um, instructions for filing an assuming office statement um, um, by definition, and I'll, I'll go over it. Um, for those of you assuming office, you will um, just fill it out and state that you have nothing to report. Um, the reason for that is uh, that at, at least um, currently, um, we, we uh, members of the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission report on a pretty um, limited basis. Um, that is um, under category 13 of the conflict of interest code, um, which, which you should have received from your form 700 um, uh, instructions. And, and essentially all that you need to report um, is any financial interest, if that financial interest during the last year caused you or should have caused you to recuse yourself um, from a legal services trust fund commission decision. So, um, you know, to help make that make sense, I just want to go over what our recusal obligations are really quickly. Um, and those are set forth in Business and Professions Code Section 6036 uh, and 6038. Um, essentially, um, there, there's a lot of language here, but essentially, um, if any decision comes before the commission um, in which you have a financial interest, you need to recuse yourself from that decision. Uh, we also ask that you recuse yourself um, from any commission decision in which you have a personal interest. And for commissioners, uh, we've defined that out as if, if you serve on a board um, of, of one of our, our grantees or applicants, um, you, that's typically an unpaid position. So you wouldn't have a um, financial interest, but you'd have a personal interest. So we make sure that you recuse yourself from any decisions um, 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 pertaining to a, an applicant or grantee that you either are, you know, a current board member of, or you know, you currently volunteer regularly with, um, you know, anything that might raise a, um, a, a appearance of a conflict. And, and the way that that works is, um, if anything specific to that grantee comes up, we just have you recuse yourself from the decision entirely. 
Um, but if there's a, a, a resolution that comes up, you know, approving grants to a whole list of organizations, you would say, um, you know, I approve, except I abstain, abstain with respect to the award to X. Um, most of you, um, because you are not allowed to serve on, on the commission, um, if you're an employee of a, um, of a, of a grantee or, or applicant um, for grant funding, um, won't have a financial interest, but I'm, I'm gonna go over what, what's considered a financial interest because some of you might still. Um, a financial interest, um, and they're defined in government code section 87103, but essentially you, have a, you would have a financial interest in a decision made by this commission if that decision would be reasonably foreseeable to have a financial impact on you directly. So if you know, we were approving a payment to you, obviously you'd have a financial interest in that or to a member of your immediate family. So your spouse, registered domestic partner, um, um, dependent children. Or if, if the commission made a decision that's reasonably foreseeable to have a financial impact on any source of income or any source of gift of $500 or more um, to you, your spouse, um, your dependent children, or to um, any entity in which you have an investment of $2,000 or more. So if you have a spouse um, or a dependent child uh, who's employed by any grantee or applicant um, to one of our grant programs, then you would have a financial interest um, in, in that, um, in that uh, organization. Um, so you would need to recuse yourself from any decision affecting that organization. And then that, that recusal, if you need to recuse yourself from a decision because of a financial interest, that would trigger Form 700 reporting. So um, when you're doing your annual forms, essentially you're gonna be looking for your, most of you will have nothing to report, but you will have something to report if you are a member uh, of your immediate family um, received income um, from one of our grantees um, or an applicant of $500 or more in the last year or if you, most of these are nonprofits, so you wouldn't have an investment in them, but if you did, um, or if you'd received a gift um, of $500 or more, and that, that would include, um, um, you know, subject to some exceptions, but, you know, attendance to gala event, something like that. If, if they give it to you, um, you'll want to just run that by us because if it, if it aggregates to $500 or more things that you're given by um, one of our grantees or applicants, that would be a financial interest. You need to recuse yourself and you need to report that. So, um, you know, essentially, you know, the, the, the big thing to remember is we just need you to file these Form 700s and the deadline is April 1st. Um, so if any of you have not um, um, received instructions, um, let us know and we'll make sure that you get those. Um, if you have specific questions, feel free to ask now or you can contact me offline. Um, and um, for the uh, two new folks, um, if you haven't, please let us know if you haven't gotten instructions on filing assuming office report. And again, because this level of reporting only says you need to report a financial interest if it caused you to accuse yourself in the last year, because you've just joined, you won't have any. But um, again, the filing is required even if you have nothing to report. And Patience, um, I saw your hand, so I, I, I will get on that. And then Efren, just, you can just email me or let me know now if you haven't received that form. Um, Catherine. Thanks. And I, I will say Brady is remarkably helpful with these forms, but uh, having heard this presentation, um, if a member makes a contribution to more than one legal services program throughout the year, and those amounts are $500 or more, are those reportable because you made a donation to the organization? No, um, no, it's you, you, your money going out. That's um, that would not be. Um, I would caution, or I would, I would consider um, that the rules are not as strict for the personal non-financial conflicts. But um, you know, if you're a major supporter of, of one of these organizations um, and you stay involved with it, you know, then I, I think it could be said you have a personal interest in the success of that organization. Um, so then I, I think you'd want to recuse yourself from those decisions um, because of that personal interest. Um, but because that's not a financial interest, that's not something you would need to report. So, you know, what, what, you, what, what these Farm 700s really looking for is, um, you know, income or gifts to you. Thank you. 
Yeah, that was a helpful question. Thank you. Any anyone else have questions for Brady or Brady? Anything else to um, to offer the commissioners? Um, no, um, you know we were were. Um, I, I imagine many of you are familiar with the um, with the Girardi report that was recently made public about um, you know some um, uh, real impropriety and and some some people um, um, who are you know no longer with the state bar but who at least had um, appearances of conflicts that they they, they didn't report, um, you know, some some um, gifts received from um, Mr. Girardi and his law firm um, that, you know, may or may not have been connected, but certainly had the appearance of being connected to, um, you know, decisions that the State Bar made in terms of not not prosecuting him for for many years. Um, so, um, you know, if there if there is a silver, silver lining to all of that, it's that we are um, really paying closer attention to our processes and procedures um, regarding conflicts, and um, and and it, that effort really depends on everybody, you know, sort of just being aware and thinking, um, both in terms of making sure that we follow the rules, and if you have questions, asking me, but but also just thinking, hey, you know, as Catherine said, she she raised something that that you know isn't technically something you'd report here, but that might lead to an appearance of a conflict and might be something that you might want to repeat yourself. So just thinking, you know, broadly about um, about appearances, because I, I know we all, all always think we can be impartial, but but it's also about appearances. So um, we, we want to keep these conversations going. Okay. Uh, thanks, Brady. Well, uh, I saw Will uh, raised his hand. Oh, go ahead, Will. I just really quickly, I was wondering, is there more documentation on examples of those personal interests which might lead us to want to recuse ourselves, even though it's not currently in the, the rules, or at least as I understood that discussion? Um, you know, and, and no, and I think this goes back to a, a conversation you and I had. Um, there's there's a lot less definition about what would constitute a personal interest than, you know, these, these you know, more numerical thresholds for for the financial interest. So um, it's 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 really um, it's really you know would an objective person looking at this think that there might be a conflict? Um, it, it's often phrased very very vaguely, but um, you know sort of the absence of examples is is, is something um, we should look at as we develop develop more trainings and materials in this area. Yeah, I think it's important as well. So thank you. All right, thanks, uh, Juan and Erica reporting on uh, the work plan. Sure, um, I just wanna remind everyone at the last, the November commission meeting, and usually it happens at the November commission meeting, uh, we go over the legal services trust funds work plan for the upcoming year. The majority of that work plan, I would say over 90% is really like the routine work, the all the grants administration work that we're doing, all the evaluations work that we've been doing. Um, Two years ago, there was a line item that was added to that work plan um, that directed the Office of Access to Inclusion, the staff, along with the, the commission, to work around um, issues of um, legal aid, recruitment, and retention, since there is such a crisis right now, legal aid, recruitment, and retention. Um, at that time, the state bar kind of budget um, was pretty robust, and so we were able to do that with general funds from the state bar budget. Um, the state bar budget is, is not doing so well for the 2023 um, fiscal year, um, so we were not provided with general funds to do any of that work. So the question to the commission was, um, if you wanted to do that work, would you be willing to use um, grants admin fund to support that work? Um, at the time in November, the commission felt like they needed a little bit more information in to make an informed decision. Um, so there was a working group that was formed to go back and see um, potentially a survey out um, to programs to see whether there was a desire or resistance around that and just doing a little bit more research. Um, that working group has met a few times and I'll turn it over to Erica Carroll who leads that working group. Um, and the two members of the working group are Catherine Blakemore and Jason Golkin. Um, so Catherine and Jason, please chime in. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks Dawn. Um, yeah, so as Dawn said with the background about why the working group was formed, um, we met several weeks ago and um, some of the questions that the working group was uh, exploring were, you know, whether IELTA administrative funds um, can be used to support the recruitment and retention work um, that Dwan described, and if not, um, what are other ways that this work can be supported um, or continue to be supported and remain in the work plan, so whether it's an alternative funding source or using volunteer commissioner time, 
um, things like that to keep the work moving forward. Um, or if the working group thinks that administrative funds can be used for recruitment and retention work, what would be, um, how would uh, we set limits around that? What would be uh, the requirements in order to access those funds for recruitment and retention work? And what kind of um, stop would be put on using them? What kind of parameters would be appropriate? And so, um, so we did meet several weeks ago and kind of talked a little bit about um, those questions. Uh, staff has been tasked with doing some research um, to, to look into what would be appropriate guidelines um, if moving forward with the recommendation to use um, administrative funds for these purposes. So, um, you know, determining what amount of costs, whether it's a percentage or a specific amount would be the upper limit, um, giving examples of appropriate categories or descriptions of work that would fall under this um, ability to use the admin funds, um, and then uh, bringing it back uh, to the commission. And then as Dwan mentioned, there was a desire to um, survey the legal aid community, and that is still the plan, but we didn't send the survey out yet because we wanted to come up with a more concrete proposal um, before bringing it to the community. Because if we were to send out the survey now, it would essentially be asking about um, grantees, general impressions or feelings about the use of admin funds for this work. Um, and we thought it would be more beneficial uh, to get a response or reaction to a specific proposal. And so that is still the plan, um, but staff has been doing some research and needs to reconvene the working group uh, in the near future before we send out a survey. So um, we'll hopefully have a more substantive update at the next meeting. Okay. Um any, did, did we want to sh reshare the work plan itself or the a screen uh, or no, we're, are we good? I think, I think we're good. We're, we'll, we'll wait till June okay. um, to do this and then vote on, because the other pieces were not controversial. Um, yeah. Our, our routine work, so it's just this piece. Okay. Um, all right, Tuan, you, you, you and um, yeah. Michael, Michael, ready? Yeah. Michael, yeah. Michael and I are up. Um, so for, for the new commissioners that every every commission meeting, we provide an IELTA revenue update since one of our main grants um, is our IELTA grants and that tracks um, interest rates. So there's just been a lot of a lot of a lot of things happening in the last year, few years and a lot of things happening in the last month or so. Um, so this this March meeting is usually um, we provide a little bit more detail to kind of tee it up for the June meeting when you all meet. And that's when you decide what the distribution is for IOLTA grants for the following year. And it's a really big decision. Um, it's, 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 it's one of like the fundamental things the commission does. And it's a, a, a decision that you know, our, our grantees follow because it implicates their budget for the next year. And so any information, any, any like kind of, if you're going a certain way or we have concerns, you know, I usually send out, uh, we send our office an email about the revenue updates, but um, if there's a kind of a direction from the commission, we also do share that so the programs can budget. Um, this, this again, like I said, this 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 is going to be a little bit more of a beefier um, discussion, just because I, we have received a lot of questions from commissioners. We understand there are a lot of concerns. Um, just just to let you know, we we are tracking the situation very very carefully, um, and and it, the revenue stream. I don't want to steal Michael's thunder, but it's it's we're on a really good path. So Michael's gonna uh, has a PowerPoint prepared uh, with all the numbers and so forth. And please just uh, feel free um, to jump in and ask questions. Thank you, Tuan. Yeah, before you start, Michael, I just want I wanted to underscore that to the commissioner. I, I this is a really essential work of the commission. So everybody, I, I would encourage a pretty robust and active sort of analysis here. And thanks in advance, Michael. No problem. Thank you. Uh, so let me share my screen real quick. And as as Michael's sharing that for the June decision, there will be a, a full-blown memo and accompanying materials for you to review in advance. Um, this again is just a preview. Okay. Yeah. And I'll just say Michael was late working late last night to update the numbers because as you all might have heard, the Federal Reserve did raise interest rate. So I had been working on something for the last few weeks and he had to modify it. So <laughs> thank you, Michael. No problem. Um it, it's it's ultimately uh, good news. Uh, the increased rate um, translates into uh, more 
IOLTA, IOLTA interest um, for us, at least for the current period. So just as a, a segue from what Duan had mentioned, I wanted to give a brief recap um, of typically the process. So as she mentioned, um, annually, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission recommends the distribution amount um, as well as the projected reserve or fund uh, balance at the end of uh, the prospective time period. Um, and the Board of Trustee approves um, those recommendations. And, and so in terms of funding, what the funding is a, a, a comprised of is, for the most part, um, it is interest from uh, lawyers trust accounts that are to funding. Um, however, there is also supplements to that. There's the justice gap fund donations, along with um, contributions from licensees um, and, and those donations as well. And so for the 2023 distribution, um, the resolution that was approved by the board was to distribute for 2023 an IOLTA grant funding amount of $50,585,254. And the reserve or the fund balance at the end of 2023, um, based off of the projections that were provided to uh, both the uh, commission and the trustees, board of trustees at the time, was $24,667,500. And so what I wanted to provide was essentially a comparison of what was approved um, by both the commission and the board and give you a perspective of what the actual activities um, look like for 2022. And like we talked about with the interest rates, um, environment being what it is, how that's really impacted the interest production uh, projection for, for 2023. So in this next slide, it's a little bit of an eye chart. Um, so I do apologize up front, um, but focusing in on the blue band. Michael, could you zoom in? Because it, it really is just those bottom numbers that is the most. Oh, yeah, maybe. Sorry, with the caption. Sorry, so zoom out a little bit more. So right there. Um, so yeah. I wanted to make sure that we displayed this really quickly, that the expense, the uh, grant expense is 50, 50, 585, 254, and the projected reserve or fund uh, asset balance is 24,667 as it was um, approved by the board and the commission. And what that equates to is 75% in terms of the reserve percentage um, as a percentage of the prior year's revenue. So this $24 million is 75% of um, this 24.3. So, so I'm sorry, uh, 32,890, sorry. And so to help us focus and, and um, give you the comparison on the white band, you can see uh, distinct differences um, when you compare uh, specific line items. So I wanted to draw your attention first off to the year-to-date total revenue. On a projection standpoint- Sorry, um, Mike, I think you're gonna need to zoom in unless it's just my eyesight. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Is that better? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think so. yeah. um, so, so for 2022, when you incorporate the projected IOLTA revenue plus the supplemental revenue from Justice Gap, donations, uh, investment interest income. In total, that was uh, $32.8 million, almost $33 million. When we look at the actual performance um, for 2022, uh, there's a large increase. So at the end of 2022, we've got $62.8 million. So the amount of the difference is almost $30 million of additional revenue that we realize um, through 2022. That accounts for 91.1%. So that, that's a big jump. And a lot of this was because of IOLTA interest. Um, the interest rates started sort of creeping up middle of last year, and there was just so much activity and movement um, in terms of uh, the, the base rate, the Fed fund rates adjusting upwards. Um, in 
and so the 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 real sort of surprising element is even though there's a baked in assumption in the model that as interest rates go up that we would anticipate and we did we we would anticipate a, a sort of decrease in deposits um from from leadership banks that actually didn't really materialize surprisingly and and so those elements this large deposit balance on a month to month basis and also these large um, these higher rates contributed to uh, much more interest revenue coming in um on an expenditure standpoint i think we did a pretty good job at projecting expenses we were about 1% difference um there so from a funding uh for a net fund asset standpoint at the end of 2022 we have 26.2 million dollars more and a lot of this like we're saying is because of interest um revenue being generated so far above what was anticipated um and so when we look at 2023 what i wanted to point to is also you know in respect to the projected interest this 64,598 this incorporates the very latest um uh fed interest rate that just happened earlier this week so so already today there has been i want to say three three increases um and, and so so you know it it's it's definitely driving um, a lot of um a lot more revenue um for us which is great um and so when you look at both 22 and 23 combined how that translates into Michael, Michael can you just pause there so just um sure. just to let the commissioner soak it in a little bit and I um I want to draw your attention to that 2023 year to date total revenue um because that's that's the line that adds up both our justice gap and our IELTA revenue so that's really um what we're what we're projecting for our our revenue for 2023 so as michael said the column the blue is what we had projected last year so the summer last year we knew interest rates were going up we didn't know how dramatically they go up so we made that projection of 46 million we're we're revising that projection now to 72 million and 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 again i have to say that our our office does tend to um project conservatively for instance um, what michael did for the remainder of this year is that he left that interest rate that just happened 2 days ago flat uh, what we've been hearing in the news is that there might be one more rate increase we don't we don't we're conservative and we don't like i don't know if you accounted for that but usually we don't um, usually we don't exactly um, so, so, you know, the other thing to, um, really also sort of bring, bring forth is, um, when I, when I start this process over again, uh, for this coming year and determining what to do for 2024 distribution, um, one, one aspect is to like, go back and review all the assumptions, uh, refresh the data set and look at the data pool so what i'm um anticipating is that the depository levels when i refresh the data set actually be a much higher and much more robust uh level than what we originally looked at uh many months ago and and that i think in conjunction with higher rates might actually take this projection to a higher level depending on what you know some of the assumptions um adjustments might be um but but you know on a conservative approach just refreshing the assumptions that we just refreshing the interest rate portion and updating for actual performance we're looking at a very positive picture for iolta um by iolta interest and what's available uh I think in in the future for both um, revenue for both grant distribution standpoint and potentially, um, you know, um, saving for a reserve scenario as well. And Can, go ahead. Sorry, no problem. And and so 
when you look at the total 2022 and 23 revenue combined, th this number sort of blows me away. It's, it's $82 million more than what was anticipated between both years. Um, and, and so just as a just quick reference point, um, you know, again, for 12 months in 2022, we collected almost $54 million. This was over 220% of what was projected. And on a monthly sort of remittance standpoint, it was close to $9 million a month of interest coming in. Um, looking at, I think, what we've seen for the last couple of months, it's around that level. It's nine, ten million dollars a month. So, um, you know, that 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 does bring a lot of positivity. Um, and and you know, for for us, um, it, it's a good picture to have. Um, but I do understand with the more recent developments in the last couple of weeks, there's uh, understandably some concern with the banking sector um, as well. So. You know, I think the 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 message here overall is even though the interest environment um, does produce favorable results for us for the time being, there's still a lot of uncertainty in terms of the market uh, and what might happen uh, in the next coming months with respect to um, the banking center and how depository balances um, will change. Um, and then we have a, a few more slides about, um, you know, our uh, what we've been tracking in our office. But um, before you get there, I just want to, for June, um, what's to come. So in June, you'll get you'll get an accompanying memo um, with updated projections. You'll get actually three sets of projection. You're getting only one this this time. But in June, you'll get a conservative kind of projection, a moderate projection. This is what we call the moderate projection, an aggressive projection. So then the commission will determine, you know, do you want to go with a moderate, with a uh, conservative with an aggressive. And then from there, you'll decide what the distribution is for the following year. And then I do want to alert you to the fact that um, we have a really outdated reserve policy. Um, as you all know, we're working on rules codification on the grant side. There's a rules committee. And one of like the major issues that's the working group that's that's been working very hard on, on this uh, is revising the reserve policy. That working group has, I think, been working for like six or eight months now on it. Um, they they will come up with some some recommendations on how to guide us for 2024. We're not going to be able to codify those yet because we have to send out for public comments. So they won't be official, but we can use that as the, the work that they've been doing um, to kind of guide us. And I know Erica or Catherine or um, if you both want to say anything and or Tammy, oh, Selena, I don't know if she's on, but from that working group perspective. Yeah. It, um, in particular, Tammy and Jeff, I'd like to hear from just as our banking um, commissioners. So uh, let's start there. Uh, and then. So, uh, you know, the, the numbers, I think, speak for themselves. One of the big unknowns we had at the time that we were looking at the projections was what would happen with the balances. And, you know, clearly rates have quadrupled. And so from that perspective, with the balances holding, I think that's what's producing the numbers that we see here. I didn't know if there was anything specific, Chris, that you were looking for uh, in terms of comments on regards to the banking sector overall. But you know, our, our banking system is sound. Uh, there's a lot of attention around the situation with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature, uh, which are really isolated type situations. Uh, and in both of those cases, deposits are protected. So uh, I, I think this is just all wonderful news. I think we need to look at it from the standpoint of continuing to have some element of conservatism towards our projections. And, uh, but you know, this is great news that the, the, the balance is held up. And as a result, we have much higher interest revenue to almost entirely to the rate increases. Yeah, I maybe it would be, uh, I, I guess it might be useful in particular for the newer commissioners just to offer a little bit of historical perspective from the commissioner's perspective. So 
the IOLTA revenue is a very large chunk of what um, our legal services providers get uh, every year. And it's a big part of what we do as a commission. And in the time that I've been on the commission, we've had very wild swings in terms of revenue at levels that are you know, almost fractional uh, of the amount that we're talking about here uh, and had to take some very conservative approach just to just to ensure that there was revenue on an ongoing basis. The, the big sort of picture question or issue that I think the commission is phrase, is confronted with whenever these decisions are sort of before us is, as Duan said, come June, we'll have to make a decision about sort of an aggressive medium and conservative um, perspective. The, the insight I think I'd like to offer is that when you're talking about revenue projections, you know, the responsibility is obviously not to get it wrong going the other direction, probably first and foremost among <laughs> our responsibilities. We don't want to uh, over promise and under deliver. So we're obviously in quite the opposite um, situation. And it, that does raise different concerns, but it does raise concerns. Um, among them is having a large pot of money that's not being utilized by legal services providers that could use it is, you know, a, a not the most economically beneficial use of the money. Now, it might be conservative and it might allow for longer term planning, but I think it does sort of raise this issue of, of, you know, are we better off leaving it to sit or are we better off getting it out the door? And that's the conversation that I think we need to have. Thinking about, you know, multi-year budgeting is sort of a secondary thing that I think the commission can consider as a policy matter. The last point I'll make here, and I'll we'll start talking um, among the, you know, answering uh, questions and whatnot, is that I do want to raise the concern about the politics, and that is, you know, the commission has increased the amount that it's being given to grants, uh, and part of the reason for that has been the commission's. Um, efficiency in doing so. And we've also received new pots of money, homelessness prevention being the, the most, you know, sort of significant um, uh, drop of money into the commission for distribution. If the, if the commission is sitting on a large balance, I do want to at least be aware that that could be misinterpreted um, as, you know, the money isn't needed. And so I do think messaging is really important here and that we should all be mindful and considerate of that fact because we don't want somebody coming in, taking a very superficial look at this large balance and then concluding incorrectly, in my view, that this money is just not needed by legal services providers because they've got so much. So that's just the politics here. And I'm just going to go down the line here and go Ephraim. Selena, and then patients. Um, and I don't know if anybody else um, wants to, but you can jump jump in the queue there as well. Hey, Chris, if I could just yeah. interject real quickly, I, I fully understand and agree with what you said there at the end. And I think, you know, the big issue that we've always struggled with here is, is it better to pay out based on how the money comes in, recognizing there's going to be a lot of volatility, or is it better to try to smooth it out for our recipients? And we've always looked to kind of a middle ground between the two, but given the extremity of the current situation, given the unusual market conditions that contributed to it, it probably is going to warrant a different type of discussion in June. I agree. Go ahead, Efrain. This is really helpful and appreciate the, the, the further background, uh, Chris. I guess uh, I have a couple of questions which are, are truly just more for my own edification. I'm enjoying the conversation as as the comment was made about the smoothing out. I'm also thinking about sort of knowing that we might continue to have the volatility for several years, whether 
we might change our, our philosophy or, or, or approach to projections, right? How do you smooth them out? Maybe add more years to how we're looking at, at these things. But the, the two uh, specific questions I had uh, for my own education as I come on board, one is I was trying to get a look at two things. One is if when we're talking about reserve, that's sort of just an inverse way to look at our spend out rate and whether we have those set. Um, in other words, we always spend out right now from the 23 projections, looks like it's a 70% spend out to the revenue. And then I saw that in, in 23 expense projections on the admin, we line item out, but then we bundled it in 2022, which raised the question for me is, are there increases in the admin expenses? Do we have a threshold there too where our admins not to exceed a certain percent? Again, not because I'm looking at anything, but I'm I'm on a learning journey right now. So those two seem like critical things to better understand. One is, do we have a spend out rate or is that just the inverse when we say reserve? And then any admin cost caps, because since we mentioned growth and staffing and all that, I'd be curious if there was growth to an admin between those two years. I'll, I'll speak to the admin piece and um, Michael, you can supplement. Um, sure. So our admin has been relatively low in terms of like, if you compare it to another kind of government agency or a private foundation, um, we're about, um, we range from 1.8 to $2.1 million. We've been short staff. So we actually haven't reached that 2.1, except for this year. And moving forward, we will. Uh, we also have to account for uh, I you know, have been saying to the staff, we need to account for inflation, um, cost of living, our salary bumps as well. Um, and we haven't been doing that. We've always left that 1.8, 2.1 flat for the last 10, 10 plus years. But but mm -hmm. if you do it, like um, if you take that percentage, it's a very low percentage in terms of the amount of, of dollar that we that we provide. I can't we, we, we have a slide or we have the information in the next slide. It's below five percent. Um, which if you're, you know, it, it's, it's a very low admin. And I think there were years yeah, nice. our admin were around one or 2%, if you can believe it, um, for, for all of this work. And the, the bundling, Michael, maybe Thank you, you. That, that piece. Yeah, so um, in terms of the expenditures, um, I, yeah, I do apologize about that. I don't think that was the intention. Um, I think part part of the the um, thought process was I know this was a lot of information to to throw up um, all at once, so it was just really like uh, really more of a real estate matter of like trying to get um, specific points communicated um, and and leaving pieces where it made sense. Um, so n definitely no nothing uh, sort of extraordinary there um, from that standpoint. Yeah, and what so do we have a set spend out rate that we have to get out X number of dollars to revenue every year in grants or no? No, oh, we no. don't have a set. That's what you you all decide yeah. in terms of IOLTA. Okay. In terms of IOLTA, you, there's the decision making point is for IOLTA. What you you all decide. There's there's subject to um, a reserve policy that that it's more and more of guidance than it is policy. And that's why I was talking about that that working group is going to firm up something a little bit more. So there's something more more guidance that will come and more strict kind of policy for the for the commission to kind of guide your decision. But there's not like a um, a it's it's not a strict formula. Right yeah, it's now. not it's codified or yeah. It, yeah, it's not, it's not. Yeah, thank you. For, for IOLTA. And then for our other grants, a lot of that is statutory, right? The legislature built in a line item for um, homelessness prevention or equal access funding, and we don't have control over that. Selena, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm one of the members of the, let me lower my hand. I'm one of the members of the working group, um, along with Catherine and a couple, and of course, Jeff and Tammy and a couple others. Um, and I just want to share a couple of points I think may be helpful for the whole commission to know. And I apologize, Michael, if you made this already. I'm, I'm also watching another Zoom at the same time. But um, okay. you know, it wasn't that long ago that we only brought in $4.5 million in IELTS revenue. And so it is not bizarre to be protective of this funding and to not push out too much. I keep thinking of a grant sta stabilization um, value and grant stabilization fund because you know it wasn't that long ago, just a decade ago, where we were trying to figure out ways to make sure that we could flatten the, the, the loss, which is why we have the justice gap fund opt out that was created in the last crisis. Um, and other things like the, the tax intercept fund was created in the last crisis. 
And so we, we know, and I know I expect patients will bring this point up. Organizations are unable to hire if they think IOLTA is going to do this because they don't know if on the upswing they hire staff and the next year they have to fire them. And, and even if that has happened seven years ago, the staff that are still there will remember it. And that impacts job security, recruitment, retention. And, um, and to this extent that we can be very careful about our net assets and um, not think of it as a, a reserve that we will never touch, but a net assets that we will dip into every time it's needed, um, which to me is not a long-term reserves. It is a temporary reserves for the next time I alter revenue drops, then that really gets programs to know that this is a stable source of funding. And it's, and it's actually something that they can hire with their IOLTA dollars instead of being worried about hiring. Um, and another couple of very quick points is um, the cash on hand issue is really important. Um, the state bar needs to make sure that there's enough funding to push out and they're not having to hold back grant payments because they're waiting for the IOLTA, um, I can't remember the word, but when you get the money in from the banks. Thank you, remittance. When yep. you bring the money over the banks, like the timing of that is sometimes delayed. And so there needs to be enough cash on hand to pay the grants. And my my um, last point is just that even though this seems like a lot of money, I also um, grants are actually a, a fairly small percentage of the total funding for our, our community. Um, I'm sure State Bar staff knows the number off the top of their head, but I believe that IOLTA, Equal Access Fund, bank grants, homelessness prevention grants, two, three, and four, and consumer debt legal services. I think all of that is only roughly um, less than 20% of the total funding for our community. And so even if IOLTA swings up and down a lot, for the individual program, the impact may not be that large. And so to the extent that they can flatten that curve a little bit or we flatten it for them, then it's more stable for their hiring. Um, but I, I feel very lucky to be on this working group because this is really important topic to our community. And I think really important for the commission to get a really good grasp of what it's looked like over time. And, and those are all my points. Thanks, Selena. Very helpful, very helpful um, perspective. Uh, Patience, go for it. Thank you. Um, so I'm really interested in the working group on recruitment and retention. So sign me up if there's room. Um, it, it doesn't really help a program to get fire hosed with a bunch of money that you where you can't hire folks, especially as Selena pointed out, if it looks like this money is temporary and we're not going to have it next year or even in two years um, to to pay staff. So I, I see these things this I'm still learning how this thing is structured, but I know as an ED, it would have been lovely to have technical assistance from an organization like this to help figure out how to ensure that we can hire the people who can provide the services using this funding. So I see that as a, as a support, as a, a, a substantive kind of support. It's not only money, it's also you want us to collect data, give us the money to collect the data. There's a lot of ways to direct the funding um, in, besides counting deliverables, counting clients served, that would be so substantively useful for programs to provide better services. And also, Chris, you're totally 1000% correct about the political optics that, that begin to give the legislature more and better data. So I, I, I can imagine a world in which the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission is, is thinking about how can the how can the programs on the ground best use the funding to accomplish the whole range of responsibilities that we have when when we receive state funding and we serve people with it and we account for it and um, and we provide the data that the legislature can use to make additional policy decisions. So I, I see that all as very much. Uh, interrelated. Um, it needs to be interrelated. I guess that's my pitch. Thank you. Thanks, Patience. Uh, Will and then Bonifshe. Thank you. Um, Selena answered so many of my questions that I don't have much more to say. I was very curious about how the EDs and their boards budget because if I feel like if I was sitting in the ED seat, I would be very risk averse 
And if I knew that Iola could drop out from under me, that would be a huge problem. So uh, as we are considering the reserve policy, and I'm sure that working group is working towards that, I would lean towards stability, making sure that there's a floor and not ever as much as possible dropping that floor out from under them so that they they really feel burned. Because if we can have that solid base, I know how powerful it can be for nonprofits. The other side of that question for me is, uh, as I understand it, and I'm looking for clarity, e the EAF makes up a huge amount of the money we give out, and that's set by the legislature after we make our allocation determination. And so <laughs> balancing, well, if we have a lot of money on hand, as Chris mentioned, the legislature might be inclined to believe that they don't need to give as much for EAF. And if we could wait until they tell us how much is coming for EAF, we might be able to balance that out. And I'm I'm not sure the best option there, but I wanted to make sure that that was being considered, and that um, as much as possible, we're we're making sure that we advocate for those programs to have stability, because I really feel like that seems like the the key point. Now, if any part of my understanding is wrong there, please correct me. But if that's how it is, uh, then I I wanted to confirm that. Thank you. So I, I can respond to that if it's helpful, Chris. Sure. Um, yeah. Go so ahead, yeah, we, we don't technically know what the EF funding amount will be by the time you all meet in June, but we do have an indication. Um, Selena has been working um, really closely with the legislature. We don't have anything, any reason to believe that EF is going to drop for next year. Obviously, if that situation changes, hopefully we will have a heads up of that. We don't anticipate that for the upcoming year, but you are correct. We don't officially know that the state budget has passed by the time you all meet to decide that. I, I know in the past we have considered. Um, if there is something we can do in terms of our meeting schedule, but everything is really tight because um, you all you all meet me and then the, the board of trustee meets in a few weeks later to vote on that. And then we need to then release budgets for programs to do and they need a month to do it. And then we got to run the allocation. So every week kind of matters. And there's like, there's not a lot of wiggle room to kind of move back the meeting um, in a way that would be, I think give us a, a lot more clarity. Um, yeah. Selena, did you want to respond just to Will or did Juan cover that? Uh, just a, a quick point. Juan's right that the, the budget process in California is quite long. So we know in January with the governor's January budget, whether there's likely to be a cut. And then there's the governor's May revise and the final budget, which we learn about, you know, late June. It, it's a, it, Eventually it's signed by the governor. Um, but we, we do hear whether there's likely to be an increase or a decrease. And for next year's budget, Equal Access Fund is, is um, it's very complicated, but there's not a decrease. It's not cut, but it's less than what we had last year because last year was a bump year. And so we do know the Equal Access Fund, the programs will feel a cut, even though we know that there's not actually a cut. It's actually a new normal of a higher amount. But what programs will see, and I think this does impact the commission's um, perhaps a, a goal to, to flatten the, the curve and to stabilize the grants or whatever you want to call it, is that HP round two will end at the end of this year. HP round three will end at the end of 2024. HP round four ends at the middle of 2024. And so there's a lot of these one-time funding sources that will end. And to the extent that organizations can know that IOLTA is stable, that means that perhaps they can move their staff who were funded with one-time, y'all's one-time funding sources, they could be moved to IOLTA funded projects. Great, Bonner Sam. That was really helpful, Selena. Um, ditto, <laughs> everything she just said. You know, I know we're not voting today um, and it's so wonderful to have Jeff and Tammy, uh, you know, uh, give us an insight on what's happening on the banking front. I have the last 11 years looked at this and thought, let's stay moderate, right? Not too, aggressive, not too conservative, let's stay moderate because we need to get the the, the money out and the uh, organizations need it. This year, with what we're seeing, um, and, and, and we still don't know 
where interest rates are going to go. We don't know if the state, if the governor's office is going to come back and um, support and, and, and provide the kind of funding that we have received the last several years in 2025 and forward. I, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm looking forward to see what the conservative numbers look like to set the money aside for programs. Um, so much of what Selena just said is what I had thought, but she really um, highlighted it and underscored the importance of it. So I know we're not seeing the uh, the the charts that Michael will will create until the the documents come out uh, for our June meeting. But is there is do we have any preliminary numbers that we could see uh, now or any any indication of where where we would be on a conservative front um, and and what we would be setting aside? And if well, not. This is the moderate projection that we're showing you, like our right. office is moderate. When we go to model, there'll be one that's leaning more conservative and one that's leaning more aggressive. And then from there, we'll, we'll come up with a recommendation for you all. Right. And again, this recommendation that's gonna come to you in June will be not just a staff recommendation. We're really gonna work really closely with that working group um, because they do have kind of a model in terms of thinking about um, cash on hand and thinking about reserve. There's they're, they're working through kind of like concepts to help us think through kind of issues and um, they're they're going to be modeling stuff. So I, the, the, the recommendation, I think, will come from both that working group and a staff recommendation together because they've been working so so closely with us on the numbers. I understand um, and heard that this is the this is the um, and excuse me, they're working uh, on my on my house. So there's a lot of pounding going on. Uh, what I wanted to know is in this meeting prior to our June meeting, I would like to see what are some of that those those numbers so that I can begin the thinking and I'm not sure if my fellow commissioners uh, it would serve them as well and maybe this is the time to have some folks from the uh, working group share out how they're they're doing their thinking so that it informs us further rather than waiting until June to begin uh, sure. thinking through this for the vote. Thank you. Okay. Erica, I don't know, um, and Michael, did you guys want to share at a high level kind of like the um, the working proposal? It's very complicated. I'll just forewarn you. So that's why um, I don't know if you're in a position to. Yeah, no, I I, I think I, I can probably talk about um, some of the, the concepts that um, after the many meetings that the working group um, have met on, I think we've settled on a format. Um, and and we'll be sort of comfortable um, trying to incorporate that with um, this this next meeting in June. So so one thing that we've all talked about um, is trying to sort of flatten um, the reserve. And 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 so doing that research, what's been apparent is um, the entirety of the legal services trust fund asset is actually a restricted fund. Um, and what's never really been been done is looking at the fund assets and segregating it in a way that says, for instance, out of a hundred million dollars of the fund assets, we are deliberately going to put a line in the sand and earmark a certain amount of it where we don't touch, and we will only touch. Um, in case funding drops uh, unexpectedly. So that approach is something we've talked about. Um, I think everyone on the working group really likes the idea. And, and so we're working towards this model of how much is this sort of restricted line item going to be um, and how do we build up to it? So there's a sort of um, uh, year to year approach to build up to a specific level uh, within the trust fund, fund assets that is um, transparent, that um, organizations can look at and say, that's the money that we can like look to in case the bottom drops, right? And so, so um, the model incorporates that. Um, it also incorporates this uh, cash on hand need. So, you know, to, to Selena's point, which she talked about earlier, we do have a lot of uh, 
bank remittances who are participating in remit on a quarterly basis. So we don't get any remittances from them uh, until the quarter's over. And, and so how that translates into things is uh, we distribute um, IOLTA grant funding on a quarterly basis at the beginning of each quarter. So for, for instance, in 2023, the first installment we sent out in January, the second we'll send out in April and then July and October. We don't realize, you know, um, the interest amounts until, let's say, on that same caption timeline until like uh, April, because that's when the first quarter ends. So so there is some of that that um, logistically we have to be mindful of. Um, and then so thirdly, the other thing that we are considering is, you know, the 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 projection, the way that it's been um, historically structured um, has a very lengthy time of uh, of how the interest rates are looked at. So for instance, in this um, slide, you see it's really covering two years worth of interest activity, all of 22 and all of 23. Um, with the way that the volatility of the market is uh, and the uncertainty in the market, it, it it's really tough to know, you know, when we do this uh, exercise, um, you know, later on this month in 2023, what the market's going to look like at the end of 2024. Um, so, so there is those things being considered, and and you know, when we when we look at all these things uh, in the model that the working group has reviewed and discussed, um, we sort of settled on um, a projection model that takes a look at. Uh, distributing uh, interest projection, but not for a very lengthy point in time, not not almost two years. It's looking at a one-year type of perspective. But even with that caption, I think that the, the amount that I recall looking at was still like $68 million. And so, so, you know, I think part of the consideration that, you know, Christian, you mentioned earlier in the discussion, well, is this, uh, approach of looking at it from a budgetary standpoint that, you know, perhaps it would make sense when you have a very large distribution number to also explore the possibility of giving grantees an option of doing multiple years on the budget as well. So I think all in all, we're really um, trying to consider all the various pain points and, and, and sort of feedback elements from everyone to, um, to move forward on how uh, how the new structure will look like. But I hope that sort of answers the question. Thank you, Michael. No problem. Um, and in the interest of time, um, Michael, would you mind uh, uh, taking off the PowerPoint and maybe you and I can just sure. do an oral update for the rest of the slides, just to s speed through. No problem. Um, quickly. In one second, okay. Um, so the, the next couple of slides, again, we'll, we'll just provide an oral instead of um, doing the PowerPoint to save time. Um, there was a question that came out of, of the work, this IELTA working group of, um, it seems like our, our, our cash on hand is, is increasing a lot. Are you guys doing anything with, with the money? Are you investing it? Are you, are you doing anything? The state bar does have an investment policy. Um, you know, it, it was it was very low in terms of during the pandemic because interest rates were low. Um, so we went back to look to see if like where was that because right before the pandemic, um, I think we were about which, uh, for the investment portfolio around one percent. During the pandemic, it dropped to like near zero, right, for our investment product. Um, we were really really happy to hear that um, the state bar um, took our our. It's not just the state um, the IOLTA money, uh, but all of the state bar's money and moved it into money market account. So it was had, had been sitting in a money market account for a couple months now. Um, there's also um, if you're familiar, there's uh, what's called a leaf account that um, public entities can put money into, it's pulled across a government, uh, lots of different types of government agency. It's a very safe product. We had some of our money in there. Um, that's all to say that it was, it was, it's really great. That money market account um, was over 4%. Um, we did ask the state bar, um, our finance, is there anything that we can put in that's a little bit more aggressive? So we just transferred in um, $55 million of ours into, um, and, and Michael can give you the, the product name, um, 
a treasury bond. But in doing this, we realized, you know what, we actually need an investment policy. The state bar is subject to investment policy, but I think the commission would be prudent to draft an investment policy that gives staff like a trigger. Um, and what is a trigger, right? We, Michael and I and finance team came up with something that we wanted to have enough cash in hand to make grant payments um, for IOLTA. We wanted to also be conservative. So we held back about um, one and a half of a quarter payment. Again, there's no policy. We did that because we're conservative. So I, what we've asked the IOLTA reserve working group is to tack on um, doing an investment policy for you all. That's that's in line though with the state bar policy. I don't think our recommendation is not to deviate from the state bar policy. They have a very sound policy. We just need a little bit more um, kind of contours to it because our grant funding and our, our revenue is a little bit unique. But we definitely do want to stay, at least I'll speak for the staff side, in line with the state bar because they have a really sound policy. Um, there's, it's, you know, it's complicated state money. Um, and so I don't think we want to deviate from that. We also don't want to be in the position, at, at least I don't think our staff does in the office of managing this. Um, we are relying on our finance team who has like a person, we the state bar banks with Wells Fargo, that they pick out kind of the state portfolio for us. Um, so we'll, that's all to say, we'll be coming back to you all at some point, that working group with a recommendation for the investment policy. But for now, um, we have it in a really good instrument. And Michael, do you want to share what that product is? In the yeah, industry? sure. Um, so in working with our um, CFO, um, she was able to uh, help us identify uh, a few options. Uh, one option was a U.S. Treasury bill um, that had uh, essentially a, a three-month maturity date. It would mature June 27th. It actually had a pretty good yield. It was 4.766%. Um, and the, there was actually another product that was also government-backed. Um, it was a uh, FHLB discount note. And FHLB stands for Federal Home Loan Bank. And that had a maturity date of June 6. It had a, a little bit of a higher yield of 4.86%. And um, ultimately, that was selected. And what that translates to in, in terms of interest revenue, on the $55 million of, of the investment amount, it works out to be about $608,000 um, for the investment period of the time. So I think we're, we're deliberately going to uh, take the chance and, and, and take that opportunity to make good use of um, these uh, interest uh, revenues that we're holding and as a part of, I think the working group thought process as well is to incorporate, um, you know, these additional investment revenues into the stream, either be in this reserve um, or as a part of the distribution model instead uh, as well. So um, wanted to sort of share that um, with you all. Um, and Go ahead. Oh, and um, I don't know if there are other questions, but um, around the, the investment vehicle or, or, you know, the investment policy, the state bars, um, the, then the last thing that we do want to share is, again, we've been getting a lot of questions about um, Signature Bank and also Silicon Valley. So we did have remittances at both of those banks. They are not, they were not large volume. Um, at Silicon Valley, it was about 40,000 the last two months and at Signature, um, 70,000. So we're not talking about a large volume, but we do have mechanisms in our office now to kind of track what's happening. Um, we've tagged, you know, what are regional banks, what are community banks. So we'll be tracking that closely. But again, I just want to emphasize again, um, reiterate what Jeff is saying. Um, the banking system, you know, the FDIC, the Treasury has come out with joint statement. Um, all those deposits at Signature and, and, and Silicon Valley are safe. And moreover, um, the, uh, you know, attorneys are required to park the money somewhere. So if it's not at one bank, it needs to be at another bank. So we might lose a little bit if they choose a bank that's maybe not a non-leadership bank, but, but it's, it's right now, at least with those two banks, it's, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to impact us too much. Um, but just be assured that we're, we're tracking that though. Jeff? And further to that point, the operations of, of signatures now being acquired by another bank. So that bank will take over that obligation. Silicon Valley Bank does continue to operate under receivership. So you should continue to receive the remittances uh, for those deposits. Great, great. Um, I, then, oh, go sorry. ahead, Michael, sorry, please. Um, I, I was just wanted to add, um, when we looked at our uh, IOLTA bank portfolio and prior to uh, categorize it based off of the reserve classification, what's considered a community bank, what's considered a regional, a regional bank. It wasn't surprising 
that out of the portfolio, 75% of the banks that are participating are actually community banks. And um, what community bank classification is that they have total assets less than 10 billion. 16% um, of the population are considered regional banks, which have total assets between 10 billion and 100 billion. Um, so when you do the math, that's about 91% of banks are within those two classifications. It sounds uh, like a lot, but when we look at it a little bit further and with a different lens, um, with the focus on interest remittances, I can say that when you look at interest remittances, 85% of the interest that's remitted to us actually come from um, top five banks, uh, Wells Fargo, Chase, B of A, Union Bank and City, and all those banks have assets above $100 billion or our nation's sort of largest banks. Um, so from, from that standpoint, in terms of risk, um, there's less likelihood that you've got uh, concerns with those larger banks. And most, again, most of the interest that is remitted to us come from these larger banks as well. <laughs> Some of us, Jeff, I don't know. I Go ahead. Uh, so a couple of things uh, in response to that. First of all, the size of the bank should not matter to this group. Uh, the market share of the five largest banks, what you shared, Michael, is consistent across the board. Uh, we have, as a banking system, we have several very large banks that have the predominant amount of market share. And that's the unique thing about our banking system in the United States is that we have a variety of different banks. But the market share that we are seeing on our IELTA distribution is consistent with what the deposit market share looks like across the state for all aspects of depository banking and size of institution should not be of concern to this group. Um, okay. I sh Duan, I, sh I should have known 15 minutes wasn't going to do it for this, but that's okay because I consider this to be really important for um, the commission's uh, consideration. Efrain? Yes, and I'll, I'll be very brief, Chris. One, just appreciate what sounds like the working group's pretty significant investment in time on a critical issue, but just not knowing the details of what the working group will be recommending, I just wanted to make sure and voice when, when we're thinking about a reserve policy, one thing that came to mind given the discussion about our grantees, right, is to structure a reserve policy that's fairly agile and responsive to situations so that we're not in a place where we set a hard and fast reserve policy that at some point when uh, revenue flows shift, it begins to actually eat away at how much money we're getting out to grantees because we're having to hit this reserve policy, but that it's responsive to the situation saying it can never conflict with that. Um, again, <clears throat> I'm saying this ignorant, not knowing what the working groups already talked about, but thought it'd be good to voice it in, in public here that we should be thinking about that to, to protect the money and maximize the money going out to community. No, you, you are definitely anticipating in your first meeting uh, what has historically been an issue. And most recently, I guess, it was at the outset of the pandemic, believe it or not, three years ago at our March meeting then, there was a you know, very robust discussion at the time about you know what, what is the purpose of this reserve? How are we going to use it? Um, how conservative are we going to be? There was, I would say, division um, I'm on. I'm in a meeting. Oh, uh, and um, right. And, thank you. Um, and there was there was a very robust discussion, and and I would say it was one of the rare instances where we did not necessarily have consensus, but we, um, I think, everybody had a very valid perspective at the time and we ultimately made a decision to get you know a lot of money out the door um and so that's why i do consider this to be really important michael um and Juan, thank you anything else you want to add before we move on to the next item on the agenda no thank you everyone and if you have other follow-up questions yeah. or ideas please feel free to um, email me and i can always get the, that feedback to the working group yeah, and and uh, just to echo Efrain's um, comment, just the working group is doing really important work. So thank you for that. And Michael, um, thanks for 
uh, really digging in on this as much no as problem. you have. It's it's very obvious that you've been swimming in these waters. So thanks. Um, okay, we've got a 15, 10 minutes. Um, Elizabeth on on the, um, yeah, this is a good news item. Lost, yeah, lost and hopefully not power. 10 minutes um, th so that we can keep moving forward. So yeah. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so I'm here to ask um, approval of delegation of authority to the executive committee to approve the law school fellowship grant committee recommendations. Um, just as a reminder, uh, Business and Professions Code Section 6410.3 allows $5 from the $45 contribution for legal aid uh, on a, the attorney licensing fee statements to fund law student summer fellowships for the purpose of supporting law students interested in pursuing a career in legal services for indigent persons. So hopefully creating a pipeline of law students into legal aid. Um, these are competitive grants open to uh, qualified legal services projects and support centers. Uh, there is a preference for fellowship serving rural or underserved communities uh, that serve regardless um, of citizenship or immigration status. Um, and this is um, the statute is in effect for two years. Um, so we're hoping to be able to gather some data um, to bring back to the legislature to continue to uh, be able to direct this funding in this way. Um, as many of you will recall, the commission formed the Law School Fellowship Grants Committee in, at its November meeting, and at that time, the commission agreed to invite members of the State Bar's Council on Access and Fairness to join uh, the Law School Fellowship Grants Committee. Um, also in November, the commission delegated authority to the committee to approve the RFP and consider and approve award determinations. Following the November meeting, um, staff along with Brady, we reviewed the Business and Professions Code 6210.5, which creates the, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission and entrusts the commission with responsibilities, including individual grant decisions, um, which are self-executing with, without any need for uh, the Board of Trustees to approve. Uh, because there are non-commissioners participating as members of the Law School Fellowship Grant Committee, um, out of an abundance of caution, because um, we thought it might be appropriate for the commission or the executive committee, if authority is delegated to it, to approve the committee's award recommendations. And so that's uh, why I am here with this item. So I have a proposed resolution um, if, if it's appropriate at this time or if there are any questions, I can answer them. Uh, yeah, so we do. We need to vote on this just to just to follow up. And for new commissioners, just so you are sort of hip to the process, which uh, Elizabeth talked about, the commission often has to ratify things. But given the timing of certain distributions, including this one, we will often delegate authority to committees, and then. And th that gives the committee the right to to do certain things, especially with regard to getting money sort of out the door. And this money came in kind of late. The timing is funky. And so there's a resolution on the, oh, do we have another slide with the resolution? Yes. There it is. Awesome. Um, and this is a feel good program. Yes. Yay. And yeah, uh, and after uh, after we vote, I can give just a, a two second or two minute update um, awesome. of where we are in terms of the review process. Okay, and great. Elizabeth, if I can just jump in, just to sure. uh, you know uh, share out further. So Vanetta and myself are are members of this uh, this committee, um, as well as two members of COAF, which is it's exciting to be able to have uh, this cross. Uh, collaboration in our mm -hmm. office, in Office of As uh, say the, the Office of Access. Um, so we are in this process working together, multiple meetings thus far. And um, so you have two folks from the commission who um, obviously are seated uh, on this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Uh, thanks, who was I, Will? <laughs> Yeah. So there's a resolution on the screen. Uh, resolve the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission delegates authority to its executive committee to approve the Law School Fellowship Grant Committee's award recommendations for the 2023 Law School Fellowship Grants. We have a motion by Will. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Patience. All right, let's run through the roll. Also, Ralph. 
Connolly? Aglogi? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Boschelli? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? He's got to unmute. Oh. oh. Yes. Sorry. Gawkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. <clears throat> King? Yes. Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Vargas? Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. And we have quorum, so yeah? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, terrific. Thank you for thank, that, Elizabeth. Thank you. And can I just give a quick two minute update? Yeah, please. Um, yeah, please. So, um, the grant applications were submitted uh, by our grantees at the beginning of March. We had, we have 38. Um, applications from 37 grantees requesting funding for 170 fellows. We won't quite be able to fund that many. We anticipate we'll be able to fund about 75 fellows. Um, and so we're very excited about that. As Vanashe mentioned, she's the chair of our committee uh, and Vanetta is also serving. Um, they've been very busy with, along with our two COAF members who are on the committee, uh, reviewing applications and going through calibration sessions. Um, and I think um, we will be, the commission will be uh, very pleased um, when we come back next time to report on who we've made awards to. So thank you very much. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm, I love it. Um, it's exciting, and I'm sure these are worthy candidates. Yes. So yes. that's 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 mm -hmm. terrific. Um, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, all right, we've got Crystal. Where'd you go? There you are. Go for it. Um, Here, I probably will take less than the five minutes allocated as okay. well. So let me get that started. All right. So this is um, for, for this agenda item. We're seeking the commission's approval. I'm discussing, uh, I think at this point, just one proposed administrative change to the annual legal aid reporting requirements. Just a quick overview of all of our reporting um, reports required that we require of our grantees. Uh, there are a lot of them, a lot of them are overlapping. So in efforts to um, streamline, uh, we, we are um, elevating this, this one request um, for, for consistency across our valuations. Um, so this is just for reference. Uh, specifically, today's agenda item talks about uh, what implicate the annual legal aid reports. Um, those specific reports include the case summary report, which reports an information on all closed cases and non-case services, our main and economic benefits reports, which are outcomes from those closed cases, as well as the impact litigation and advocacy report. Um, one, uh, one, a couple of characteristics for these annual legal aid reports is that it collects information about the work of the entire organization, regardless of funding sources. So this includes um, work funded by both state bar grants and non-state bar funds. Um, and then the grantees also report on information on behalf of low-income clients, seniors, or in individuals with developmental disabilities in California. Um, basically, this is our, our one change. Uh, and, and looking at the reports, we do, uh, you know, we do want efforts to streamline and, and make sure uh, evaluation, uh, evaluation information is collected consistently. Um, one change that we noted um, that we had it um, requested from, from grantees on our case summary report is a, is a more specific breakdown of the other services piece um, in terms of um, number of educational workshops held, number of people served, um, and the outreach events as well. Uh, we're just uh, seeking the um, approval of the Trust Fund Commission to implement this change uh, for the uh, case summary report uh, for the 2024 partnership grants. Uh, all grantees currently report um, in this manner for their other grants. We're just getting case the, this CSR report up, uh, sort of up to speed or uh, up on the same level. I see Will. Uh, hotline calls is removed. Is that intentional or? Oh, apologies. The hotline calls will remain there. The emphasis was on the highlighted piece of um, okay. that breaking the breakdown. Hotline calls will still remain there. Yes. Good catch. Okay. I had a recent experience with that. So that, that one's personal. I'm glad that it will remain. See? 
And if no questions, I'll advance it to the proposed resolution, which is um, to approve staff's recommendation uh, regarding the changes to the annual legal aid reporting requirements, which will be implemented for the 2024 grant recipients. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, okay, there's a resolution on the screen. I will entertain a motion to approve the resolution. Alkin moves. Thank Jeff you. second. Thank you, Jason and Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, go ahead and let's run and roll. Sorry about that. Um, Al Saraf? Yes. Connolly? Aglagi? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Bushelli? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Vargas, Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, new commissioners, you can see from these reports just how much stuff is coming on below the surface. Um, and just to keep keep the the you know the trains running on time. So anyway, thank you, Crystal. Uh, do we need just a agenda question? Catherine, you're still here, I think. Uh, Catherine Lesh, she'll be back around too, okay. but um, we still have the XCOM agenda item. So yeah, okay, good. That I was just making sure we didn't want to bump it up. So great. Um, okay, so yeah, let's hand it off. We we're on our timing is okay, and just we can press through straight through to or take a five minute you know break after the X XCOM report. So my inclination is to take a break. Um, after this report, if anybody really wants to not take a break, um, you know, let me know. But I'll plan after this report to do it. So, Chris, um, take it away. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Okay, you should be seeing the care court slides. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's nice to meet you, new commissioners. My name is Chris McClonkey. I'm a program supervisor in the Office of Access and Inclusion. And joining me for this presentation will likely be Rocio and Tuan. Um, I've just combined both of these items, 5.1 and 5.2. It's a rather quick, like two minute update, sort of like on the care court planning grants, and then mostly about the need or staff's recommendation rather to the commission um, to create a new committee to over or otherwise delegate authority for what will be the 2023 CARE Court grants and delay foundation for that resolution. So uh, background, especially for that, we were, I first presented on this in the fall and um, when we were talking about what we call the CARE Court planning grants um, and for the, uh, for to refresh everyone's memory and for the, uh, the newest commissioners, um, there is a new law um, it is called the Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment Act, and it was uh, signed by the governor on September 14th last fall. And what it does, it, it's, it's rather intricate, so I'm not going to purport to present the whole act, but, but to give you the gist of it, um, and then maybe staff would dive into it with a committee. But what it essentially does is it creates a new court program uh, that will start rather soon for some counties, would start for some counties on October, October 1st of 2023 this fall um, for Glynn County, Orange County, Riverside, San Francisco, San Diego, Stanislaus, and Tuolumne, um, with the remaining counties in California launching this new court program by December 1st of 2024, so a little over a year later. Um, and I'll just note right now that LA County uh, was, was part of that December 1st, 2024 group. It has it's decided to accelerate its launch of this new program to this December, December 1 of 2023. Um, and essentially, and we, we, we 
attached the, the language of the act to the materials for today's meeting. Um, so just to hopefully get a chance to at least skim it. But essentially what it does is it creates a new court program for Californians with qualifying enumerated in the act and severe mental health issues. It specifically min mentions schizophrenia diagnoses. I think it could be slightly broader than that. Um, but um, for those Californians who um, the court finds um, on review of a petition um, is unlikely to survive safely in the community without supervision. Um, and what it goes on to say is it calls like community services and supports, unlikely to survive without that supervision and whose condition is substantially deteriorating or who needs help to prevent a relapse or a deterioration of the condition that would be likely to cause a grave disability to them or serious harm to themselves or others um, to receive community services and supports. There are, uh, and, and those services and supports are essentially things like stabilization, medication, behavioral health care, housing, and other support. Um, there are other criteria to qualify as a care court respondent, right? The subject of a care court petition. They have to be an adult. The court has to find that they would be likely to benefit from participating in care court, that that would be, I, I can't remember the exact wording, but like it would be like the least restrictive option for them, something along those lines. Um, but essentially um, what it would result in is um, uh, if the case isn't dismissed, one of two things, either a care agreement, which is essentially a voluntary settlement agreement with the, between the the petitioner or substituted petitioner, usually I think it will end up always being the um, county behavioral health office is like the other party at the end. Um, between the, the county behavioral health office and the respondent, voluntary agreement for services. And if um, no voluntary agreement um, um, is possible, then a court ordered care plan. So agreement, quote unquote, versus plan, quote unquote. Um, um, and that, that was your background. So. So hopefully it, it, the committee, I think staff and the committee can really dig into like what this program looks like, but essentially jumping to the part where like the commission's role is the, um, um, actually I'm gonna tap forward one slide and I'm gonna go back to that one in just a second, is essentially the CARE Act re um, uh, requires the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission to fund qualified legal services projects to serve as counsel to the respondents, to provide representation to respondents, the subjects of those petitions, in CARE Act proceedings and in CARE agreements and plans. And it also directs the commission to fund support centers. Uh, these are just the business profession, the professions code, QLIS business support centers for what it says is training, support and coordination of this program uh, and, and, and QLSP's role in it. Um, the, um, it, it does say that courts, the care courts should appoint a public defender if no QLSP is available to represent respondents in that county. So essentially it kind of looks like QLSPs have the right of first refusal, so to speak. And then if no QLSP is available, um, the public defender has to do it. Um, and then this is where I'm, um, oh, and then, yeah, actually I'll tap back. I just wanna to remember to tap back to the slide before this, I don't forget. Um, the, um, this is not in the act, but um, by way of background, uh, it is estimated, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a very rough estimate that multiple agencies are sort of leaning on at the moment, that about 7,000 to 12,000 Californians statewide, so not just cohort one, uh, might qualify for care court. That's not necessarily the number that would go through it every year. It's, it's kind of just like would meet the criteria for care court. Um, since cohort one, those seven counties, this is not including LA, but just the other seven counties is about 25%, slightly over 25% of California's population. Um, our office just took that range, that 7,000 to 12,000 Californians and divided by four. So, so rough estimate for cohort one would be 1,750 to 3,000 people. Um, the, yeah, uh, Judge Klein. Yes, I wanted to comment because um, I'm quite skeptical about some of the uh, people might be applying for grants. Uh, but by way of background, I spent three years in the full-time court that deals with people with severe disabilities, mental disability, mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar. And then I spent a year and a half in a juvenile um, delinquency court, which is a collaborative court. 
which ironically was, I believe, started at the suggestion of public counsel, and they were actually a very valuable ally, although I don't know if the public counsel representative is still on this call, but they've come out against quite vehemently the, the, the care courts. But the, the, the bottom line is the public defender has been handling these, certainly in LA County. And I'm not sure who in another agency would be training public defenders. I mean, the basic skill set required in, in these type of proceedings and, and the care courts are not that much different from Laura's law and the traditional um, conservatorship courts. There, there are some differences who can file, et cetera. But the basic lawyer skills are cross-examining, you know, psychiatrists, cross-examining family members, communicating with the clients. And the one shortage they always had, and this came up uh, in an early meeting when, uh, that there was a grant, which I thought was wonderful for one of the uh, mental health courts, I think Lisa Jaskell was on the line, to provide what, what was really missing when I was there, which was social workers to link some of these families up with services. The one value I found specifically with public counsel, they were sort of my go-to uh, legal uh, organization was denial of services because when we saw people who needed services, whether it be regional center or other agencies, uh, sometimes uh, when they were denied, that was not within the jurisdiction of our court. I just call in um, a, a lawyer who's no longer with public counsel. It's a joke with him. He was our lawyer. So I'm not sure what these grant uh, applicants are, are going to be doing that that is of any value. They're not going to be training public defenders. Public defenders would train them. Uh, and, and the patient population, contrary to what I, I, I read in the paper, is that they are severely delusional because the question was, um, are, are they deprived of their decision making? But, you know, when a guy's walking down the middle of the street screaming for Jesus, uh, the, the, you know, or someone comes, I mean, literally these cases where, you know, uh, they have severe health issues and they're totally oblivious to it. Or I think the food is poison. Of course, they don't think there's any need for meds because most schizophrenics are not aware of their delusions. So, so I, I think we really have to be skeptical uh, of, is this the best place for these funds to be spent when the real need when I was there was, was the linkage of social workers to find the appropriate programs. Um, anyway, so that's... Uh, Kind of my concern about is this just the pot that people are going to be applying for without us really questioning just what are they going to do? Thank you, thank you, just fine. That, yeah, and um, I I think the you you raise important public policy points. I think staff's response might just be that um, for the for now, the, and this is the first this um, next year will be the very first year this program has existed in California. So I think there's a lot of things that California will be figuring out as far as how to refine and optimize the program. But for now, the legislature's and governor's vision is that QLSP, Qualified Legal Services Projects, might serve as counsel to respondents with support centers providing some technical assistance to them, the Department of Healthcare Services providing some technical assistance to them, and that um, it's obviously asking the commission, directing the commission to make at least this initial round of grants. I'm still not clear. Public defenders are doing this on a daily basis. What, what, what possibly is this QLSP going to uh, add to the um, process? I mean, do they know how to cross-examine a psychiatrist or a family? I mean, that, that's the reality when we get down to what actually happens in these cases. I mean, right. the concerns by the opponents, and if the public counsel representative is, is there, I welcome her input, is, you know, using it with people who do have some decision-making, you know, capability. I mean, that's what the public defenders go after, least restrictive alternatives. And, I think, and uh, so what, what are the QLSPs going to do? Well, I think through it, through the application process, they would have to establish their ability to do the, the work. It, for the commission to make that award. And and then the act specifies that if no QSP is, is given funding to do it, then the public defender would do it. Yeah. I don't know if like Lauren, I, oh, I'm I, sorry, Chris, I didn't mean to cut off. Yeah, that's okay. I'm just going to uh, have Lauren comment just to bring some of the community's perspective into into this discussion. But I would just say, I, I think these are the public policy concerns that you're not alone in expressing. Go ahead, Lauren. 
I just wanted to provide some additional background that might clarify um, some of your questions, Judge Klein. In the legislative history of how this was created, the governor's office was interested in having legal services organizations involved rather than public defenders because these individuals are gonna be placed on a care plan to access services and housing that they will be on for a year until they can successfully graduate. And legal aid lawyers are equipped to do the kinds of things that will be needed to be successful on that plan. So addressing denial of services, connecting people to social workers that can help them get on housing lists, these sorts of of things, as opposed to public defenders who have kind of indicated that they'll represent someone at a care court hearing, but they are not going to be providing those ancillary services that might lead someone to be successful on their care plan. All right, well, I'm glad for your explanation, because like I said, the real weakness I always felt, not so much, are, are you the uh, uh, public counsel representative, the attorney? No. Oh, okay. Because uh, no, no, that that to me was the big void, and that's why I thought that grant uh, that we approved earlier was, was um, very useful. Because I used to I asked the public defender, "Why didn't you guys get a social worker?" You know, and they they just gave me unsatisfactory answers. Unlike the collaborative court with the juveniles, where we had on our team educational specialist, um, uh, an outstanding probation officer really was a, a master's in social work and left to practice in that area. And um, a, I'm drawing a blank, uh, a, a social worker. And, and that was the really critical missing link. So if they're doing that, I, I, I think that's really good because I was hoping the care money would go to just that when the pub, because these are gonna lead to conservatorships. I mean, that's, I, I can see the handwriting on the wall, which is fine. But um, you have to deal with right services and denial of services. Now, if that's their limited role, fine, but they shouldn't be in, you know, trying the case in certain public. <clears throat> the, the, the one thing is, it, public policy, you know, considerations like that are, are definitely important. Um, and I don't know if Dwan or uh, Brady or, you know, you might have like a gentler like perspective than the one I've been carrying around in my head, which is the like, it is now law that the I mean, like, it, I think it's probably the legislature will like refine this over time because it's like its first go. But like this, it was signed into law, so this is the, this the commission must run this grant process. Yeah, like the legislature has decided that, and the governor agrees. So I don't, I don't really know if they're like the commission can't opt out of that, to my knowledge. I don't know if that's wrong, Brady or Dwan, but. This is the charge. I'm not suggesting opt out. No, I'm not suggesting opt out if the law requires. I'm just saying be very skeptical about what just what these agencies can provide and how well do they really know the current system. Because we had an advisory committee, and to be blunt, uh, with, with a, except for the, the late Jim Price of Mental Health Advocacy, who I didn't see apply, he, he was very knowledgeable. But um, you know, I even held a session once, I think, of the juvenile group. Tell me what we're doing wrong. So tell me what we're doing right. You know, just open in. I'm here to listen. And and I found, frankly, very few useful comments because they just were not familiar with the court system. I'm glad we have the care court because it's going to be more money. But it really isn't that different from what we currently have today. I'll just say that. Uh, I wasn't there when they were doing Laura's Law, which expanded it, but just a traditional um, process to get a uh, LPS conservatorship, not so much a probate conservatorship. Those aren't really for these cases, which I also did. It's really not as revolutionary. And that, that's why I'm sort of skeptical, uh, unless it's providing social services. I mean, the, the money's going to social workers in the courtroom. That's great. I, I, I think I think it's... It... I think it's probably going to be like, yeah, probably representation in the proceedings for the most part. Well, representation yeah. is different than yeah. social workers in the yeah. court. Assisting yeah. 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 I mean, keeping in mind the commission's role here, but go ahead, Vanetta. You're unmute for us. Thank you. No, I was just going to echo um, uh, Judge's client's sentiments around the importance and also, um, Lauren, the importance of. Uh, well, assessment and case management and continuity of care, because representation is great, but ultimately it's a service delivery component um, that's going to, you know, impact outcomes. And so perhaps when we're reviewing the opportunities for grants, having the chance to um, 
determine what criteria will be used to determine whether these um, organizations are, you know, the best fit would be helpful, but solely support the, the need for a continuity of social work. Yeah, well, I'm here if there are any yeah. questions in the future, because I've, like I said, lived this life. Well, we're right. going to be asking the commission to make a committee, actually. So if you want to stay <laughs> yeah, involved, I think you would be a good. There's a moment to seat. step up. Yeah, yeah. all right. The, uh, step so, up. <laughs> the, I'm on the uh, banking committee. Maybe you can switch. I don't know anything about uh, banks. <laughs> and I um, I'd rather be on this one. Yeah, so that's a good, that's a great, this is a great conversation to show sort of how the um, all a lot of stakeholders at, at different agencies and in legal aid have been trying to figure out what everyone's optimal role is and within the framework of like the way the act is written right now. Um, so I, so I, oh, go I, ahead. I, I can bring to the table that uh, to be allowed, I can communicate with the, you know, the head judge and uh, the mental health court who would have this because, uh, you know, I know these people, so I could get their insights. All right. I've said my piece. Happy to help. Thank you so much. Do um, something useful rather than yeah. putting me on the bank committee. <laughs> um, okay, so um, to keep us, on, oops, I didn't mean to click ahead. To keep us on time, I'll, I'll just um, push push ahead. Mm -hmm. So, so the um, so this is where I'm gonna I'm gonna do the thing where I jump jump back to the other slide because I, I kind of wanted to like give you that context. So, so as a reminder, um, the Budget Act of 2022, which was last year's Budget Act. Um, allocated $250,000 for what we've been calling planning grants for qualified legal services projects and support centers to kind of engage in a planning process before this court program launches for cohort one. Um, so qualified legal services, they, so they have that money now and they are in, engaging in that process. The um, qualified legal services projects and support centers that, that already serve the cohort one counties, which again, excludes LA, it's those other seven counties, Tuolumne Glen, San Francisco, San Diego, Orange Riverside, um, Stanislaus. Um, they, um, they had the opportunity to apply, 18 uh, applied for funding to participate in the planning process with their county stakeholders. Um, 15 are qualified legal services projects, three are support centers. Um, the grant, uh, it was it's $13,808 each. They, they split it equally. There was, there was no funding for like the administration of the grant, it just it went, all went to them. And um, it's the expectation for receiving those funds that they engage in good faith with those county stakeholders and with the state bar, judicial council, and LAC, um, which they've all been doing. And they meet with us at least monthly for planning sessions and report back moments. So this is different than the CARE Court grants that the commission would need to make this year under the CARE Act for the program that launches on October 1st. But I want to just remind you that these grants, these planning grants are also happening. Um, it was that was that was two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the planning process. The amount that's been proposed <laughs> in the governor's draft budget from January for counsel to respondents, and that would be qualified legal services projects, and to our knowledge, um, public defenders. Like that, that this amount of money would be for whoever does that performs that role is six point one million dollars for the seven counties in cohort one. Um, the uh, that we are. Um, um, not sure what the number would be for Los Angeles County to begin its program on December 1st, um, because it announced its acceleration of the program after the governor's January budget came out. Um, some of that 6.1 would need to cover the administrative costs to the Judicial Council and State Bar to actually administer grants. Um, um, and it would be the Budget Act of 2023, this year's budget, that would actually specify the amount of funding and, and possibly the way the commission should distribute it. So the, the commission, sorry, the legislature often says, we want this to be a formula grant or we want this to be a competitive grant or if they specify a formula, they'll almost always specify what they want the formula to look like. So it's possible that the budget after 2023 will do something yeah. like that. Um, I just wanted to know, and I know we're we're kind of running a little behind schedule, so I can go I can go a little faster through these next couple of slides. This is if we had time slides, but I'll let Christian or Duan know if I need to speed up, uh, or there you can let me know if you need me to speed up. But essentially, the um, the, the the access to justice community, um, this commission, the the QLSPs and support centers, lack um, they they have the opportunity to sort of weigh in on what they how they think the funding ought to be distributed. There's, of course, it's up to the legislature and the governor ultimately in the budget act 
how to distribute the funds via the commission. But um, if if the, there was much consensus that it ought to go out by formula or competitive process, we could sort of weigh in on that. And so I just wanted to update, staff wanted to update the commission that staff, the judicial council, LAC, um, and other partners have been, uh, and, and QLSP support centers who got planning grants have been having a lot of meetings about whether and how to recommend a particular approach to distributing the $6.1 million, just so you know that these conversations are happening and sort of the options that everyone has been exploring. So I'm going to do that. This is just kind of an update. This isn't like submitting this for like a vote or anything, but I just want you to make sure you all know what's happening. Um, what has been floating around in meetings is at least 85% of the funding would go to qualified legal services projects. Again, this would be something that maybe we could share with the Department of Finance or Legislature Governor. So uh, to QLSPs and public defenders for the actual representation of respondents. This, this percentage, 85%, is actually consistent with what the IELTA formula uses and equal access fund grants used, 85% for Q services by QLSPs. 10% um, for support centers to provide technical assistance. Um, and then 5% for Judicial Council State Bar costs. That 5% is the number that the legislature has been using to cover um, uh, agency administrative costs for the last few rounds of grants that we've been administering. Um, the, what always happens is any amount that Judicial Council State Bar doesn't need or use would roll over to grants for services in the next year. So we could just assume, we're kind of holding in our heads that it would look the same here. Um, as far as so normally support centers sort of share because they provide they would be expected to provide technical assistance to counsel to respondents for all counties in cohort one and eventually the whole state they usually they usually split their share of the pot equally so we just kind of assumed that for now but for qualified legal services projects there's a real question as to how much funding each county would get and if the QLSPs would need to submit competitive proposals and so things that we've been looking at yeah. are things like um, should each county's allocation for funding for council to respondents be based off its general population? No one's really pushing for that one, but we looked at it. Population living at or below 125% of federal poverty. That's what IOLTA and Equal Access Fund uses for general legal aid funding or something even more closely tied to like what what this program, the, the Californians with whom this program would be interacting. So something like the number of involuntary holds or and or conservatorships that that county reports to the Department of Healthcare Services pursuant to like welfare and institutions code reporting expectations. Um, we've been looking at formula, we've been testing formulas that set county funding floors because uh, almost any of these proxies for need like you know poverty population or something would leave some counties with very little money. So bringing them up those counties up to a floor um, setting grant floors or no grant floor, and then just distribute. We looked at whether or not if qualified legal services projects multiple apply for a single county, could would they both possibly provide services? Would they would they split the amount of funding on the basis of their qualified expenditures, or should they submit competitive requests for proposals? So this is. I don't actually think we have consensus yet. I don't know if Tuan might or Rocio might disagree with that, but I think we are deep into conversation and, and evaluation of these options. This is just my reporting back that the, the OA and I lack the QLSP planning grantees and support centers have been talking about it um, so that perhaps we can take an idea to the legislature. Okay. I don't know for some reason. I'm going to actually, Tuan, unless you want me to show, because I, because I think we're behind on um on our schedule i was going to show skip this the tables that just kind of showed like oh actually no i actually will show something because i think this is interesting this is i just wanted to show like the, the, why there might need to be something like a county funding floor so we just ran it just to model it i don't actually know if there's a lot of um if there's a ton of support yet for for going with the county's IOLTA and EAF proxy for need, which is 125% of federal poverty population, but we mocked it up so people could see it. And it kind of models the need for a funding floor. This That's what this table is showing you. It's just saying like, if you look at Glen County and Tuolumne, their share of cohort ones, um, indigent person, or not indigent person's definition, but 125% IOLTA formula um, sort of um, proxy 
um, would would only give them eighteen thousand dollars ish for Glenn, twenty five thousand dollars for Tuolumne. So that kind of just to illustrate that that there may need to be a floor for each county. Okay, that was kind of worth showing you, I think. Duan, is it okay for me to skip over the? Um... Yeah. Okay, great, great. So this is, yeah, and this it, I'll just go through this slide very quickly to also note. Uh, and put put it on your radars that six point one million dollars is is almost certainly going to be very, very tight for um, funding for council. This is what we've been hearing. Council to respondents for cohort the seven counties in cohort one. Um, if you do if you do end up assuming eighty five percent of that will go to qualified legal services projects for public defenders to actually serve as counsel. Um, and I mean, maybe that, Maybe it will go up. Maybe it'll be ninety percent or something. But if it's if it's um, if it's five million one hundred eighty-five thousand dollars, all we we did is we we took the range of Californians we estimate would qualify for care court in those seven counties. Again, they might not actually all go through the program, of, you know, in one year. But just just we took the the range we have, which is the number of people who might qualify, one thousand seven hundred fifty people, maybe up to three thousand people, and and um divided that into $6.1 million. It gives a range of $1,720 per person to, to about $3,000 per person. The, you know, They won't all go through the program in the first year, but if they all did, that's how much money is, is has been proposed. And we've just been hearing from a lot of directions that $6.1 million would be very hard to, to, <clears throat> to work, um, at least for some counties that expect to have a lot of petitions in the first year. Duan, uh, Rocio, Lauren, is there anything on that you don't want yeah. to provide you the opportunity to talk about this piece? I, I think that covers it. I mean, we can always get into more details at the committee level, but. Great. Okay, so. Um, oh, Jim, then, has, oh, Jim has his yeah. hand up. Jim. Yeah, just a quick question on those tables. Why did you use 125% of the poverty level as opposed to 200? Because that's what the IOLTA statutory formula still uses. So the Business and Professions Code did update the definition of indigent person to, um, to among other criteria, be 200% of the federal poverty level. But the IOLTA funding formula still uses looks at 125% of federal poverty. Um, I don't know if yeah, but the, you want to add anything to that. <laughs> But Jim, that's um, what Chris said. Like we use it to model. We're actually probably not going to end up recommending that. Um, we uh, Chris got a hold of um, uh, involuntary hold information in each county. Um, so we're it's it's fairly complicated though. There are different categories, but um, that might be a better proxy for what we've we've heard for this particular pop population. And, and just for the numbers' sake, I I would also strongly support a floor because your northern counties are really going to get uh, glossed over if you use the population data. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of other things that we, we want to try to layer on, which is like cost of services, because an attorney that's practicing in San Francisco um, might get paid more um, than in an otherwise county. So we're trying to yeah. factor in a lot of various. It, it's very complicated. Um, yeah. But Chris is Chris has been doing a great job. Selena. Selena. Just a really quick answer or point to, to Jim's question about why 125 and not 200% for the modeling. Um, when we um, advocated for that change before the legislature a couple of years ago that came into effect with 2022, the modeling I think that Jim did was really helpful to show that the impact on rural counties was just too unpredictable. And we were worried about moving to 200% for the formula allocation because we thought that several rural counties were gonna lose a significant amount of funding. And so at that time, when we did that advocacy, we talked with legislators who also said, did you do this on purpose? Um, because we were worried that it would drop the aisle to grants to a, a too small of an amount in some of those counties. But it is weird, but it was intentional. <laughs> Thank you, Selena. So the, we're, we're not actually submitting the, um, the timelines to you for approval and I'll say why, but we, but we put to what we're just called example timelines and the short memo for this, for this item. The, um, it's, I, I just have those two timelines and then it's the resolution for Christian to know the timing of this piece. The, um, what's, what the memo suggests and what staff recommends and what you'll see in the resolution is that the commission delegate authority 
to make these, not to make, sorry, not to make the grants, to, to approve a request for proposals if the Budget Act ends up making it a competitive grant, um, but also to approve a timeline, an application, the reporting requirement, sort of the works, um, and, and then to score or otherwise review the applications and then come back to the commission with the recommendations for 2023 care court awards. Um, and the reason staff recommends to the commission that it delegate this, including the approval of a timeline for these awards to the committee is because the, um, the timing is going to be really tight and we don't know yet, staff does not quite know yet if it would be better to try and release this application in May or June. And here's why. So the actual amount of funding that will be available for qualified legal services projects and public defenders to provide representation to respondents won't become official, finalized until the Budget Act passes in very late June or maybe even July. And this program needs to launch in the seven counties by October 1st. So of course there's a little time there, but the county courts and the public defender's offices really need to know as early as possible who might be serving the respondents. And one way for them to know that is who has applied for funding to serve respondents in that county. If no one, if no QLSP has applied, then it, they can, that county, the Superior Court, the Behavioral Health Office, the Public Defender's Office can fairly infer it will be the public defender. If one QLSP has applied or multiple QLSPs have applied to serve that county, then they'll know they need to wait to figure out if the commission is going to make a grant to the QLSP. And then, and then maybe also if they, to see if the QLSP is going to be able to serve everyone or only some of the, um, of the respondents in that county. And so there's, there's a needs to be a balance between making decisions early so county stakeholders get the information they need when they need it. Um, but also not making them so early that we don't know what the final award, amount of funding is that's available or how the commission's even supposed to distribute it, formula versus competitive. Oh, and Catherine, I see your hand. So I'm just going to say one more thing and I'll, to, to you. The, um, so the two options we put in the memo, and we can't necessarily even recommend one yet, is uh, one, wait for the uh, governor to release his May revision, which is supposed to be available as of May 14th, have the committee, whatever committee the commission might choose to delegate this to, meet right away to approve an RFP. This would be before the legislature actually passed a budget bill um, with an amount and, a, and, and, and maybe by then be kind of guessing if it'll be formula RFP distribution. Uh, this would be very aggressive time-wise. Or timeline number two, wait for the legislature to pass a budget bill. It wouldn't be final yet, but the governor would have to actually like you know, uh, like a veto, line veto something in it. Um, but we'd have more certainty about what the amount of funding will be and how the commission's supposed to distribute it to do a June release. Staff thinks having a committee kind of meet, with a committee will to meet more often response to budget developments or new information from the Department of Finance or um, um, LAC or the Judicial Council, then the commission, would, it'd be much easier to convene a committee than like an emergency session of the whole commission. I didn't mean for Catherine to go so long that you lowered your hand. No, no, no. You've, <laughs> you've answered my question. I'm fine. Okay. Um, but that's it. So the, the next slide is actually the proposed resolution. And I don't need, I can put it up whenever you want, Christian. And Juan. Yeah, let's put it up now. I yeah, First of all, I would just thank you, Chris. Um, there's a lot there. I think Judge Klein's points are well taken. They're shared. And it, the situation is rather fluid. Um, so we'll, we shall see sort of how this shakes out. I don't think this is a situation where there's sort of consensus in the community even about how to proceed um, or a particularly prescriptive situation that we find ourselves in with respect to the actual statute as well as direction from the governor's office. So on the one hand, we've got a, a situation that is in some ways, uh, amenable to change, which is, a, I guess, a good thing. It can be molded in some respects. Uh, and on the flip side of that coin is that lack of prescriptive sort of ness is a little bit um, challenging because we don't necessarily 
know how smoothly things are going to go in lots of different ways. Go on, go, go ahead. And, and by the way, please read the uh, resolution on the screen because this is the act that we are now taking potentially if we approve this today to help sort of create a committee that we had considered when we met in November uh, to talk about the possibility that this could occur. Yeah, uh, the other thing I just wanted to add is that um, we have the cohort one, um, which are set to start services October 1st, but Los Angeles County has also opted into, um, they're, they're supposed to be with the rest of the other counties, but they're gonna be providing services in December. So we've been told that there's gonna be a separate pot of money that's gonna be allocated to them that then the commission will also have to distribute. Um, so this committee will need to then de determine whether um, the Los Angeles County allocation should go in tandem with cohort one or having a different process. We've already heard from, we convened informally with the Los Angeles programs. They obviously want a little bit more time to think about it. So they would advocate for it to be on a different track, but there, there's just a lot of moving moving pieces to this. And so we do think that a commission uh, will help kind of the staff brainstorm and move things along. Um, it, it's very fluid. Uh, we have in our office um, at any given time between three and five staff working on it. It's, it's a heavy lift. There are between three and six external meetings with the various stakeholders every week. We have dedicated a lot of time. And just to let you know, uh, we received no admin funds for this, our planning grants. We are having to dip into our IELTA funding to, to, do, the, to do this work. And now that we have already started undertaking the work um, for the the larger, the main grants, and that's going to be pulled up out of IOLTA. I have made it clear to the governor's office and the legislature that without admin funding um, for like the remainder of, of the funds that will be distributed, we, we, can't, we, we can't operate like that um, in this office and the commission uh, would not be in support of that. We, we just can't. We've been pulling out of IOLTA in a way that's not, not quite comfortable and that we have no option because there are not other funding. So I do want to make that note for the record. Yeah, I, and and I do think uh, direction for staff from the commission is really the essential part of this, um, you know, the, of this resolution and the establishment of this committee. So I, I will, I guess, start just by soliciting a um, motion for the resolution, and we we can see if there's a second. And so Catherine seconds the motion. Oh, well, Chris Efrain has who, his hand yeah, up. Yeah. Let me oh. see. Well, sorry, one quick sec. Did somebody move prior to Catherine? Oh, I thought you were moving, but I will move if you weren't moving. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you, Catherine. You said you were entertaining a second. So yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry if I misspoke. I don't um, know. Um, so but Catherine I'm sorry, moves. I just I didn't mean to interrupt, but I saw Efren's hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Let me take the second before I see if there's any further discussion. If there is a second, anybody? I'll second, I'll second it. Okay, thanks, Angie. So we've got a motion and a second. Efrain, did you have a question about this? No, Chris, I, I withdrew my hand. It was not pertinent to the content of the resolution. So I can always just, I'll withdraw that question. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, let's take roll for the um, resolution on the screen. And and um... Chris, before we do, uh, just oh. a little more discussion. You've made mention a couple of times uh, that there's, you know, Judge Klein's uh, uh, voicing his opinion on this is is uh, uh, not solo, and that there is some. I, I, I'm just I'm I'm sensing that there's some controversy on this, and I, if there's anything further that you may know and you could share out, it would be good for us to hear. Yeah, I. So this is the what I guess I think would probably be most helpful. I think this idea is addressing a public policy need that is largely obvious to most people. Um, I think Judge Klein's points are that, you know, in the category of sort of there's nothing new under the sun, um, we've tried various forms of this over the years and he's been involved in some of them. I think this current plan involves legal services providers in ways that are a little unusual, um, certainly non-customary. And you can put all of that into the category of sort of, why does that matter to the commission? And then we have to talk about why it matters to the commission, which is that the commission has been asked to step into the role of um, 
you know, of a, another trustee role in distributing money. And so I'm somewhat protective of the commission's role here because I don't think that there's necessarily consensus in the legal services community that we, you know, see um, in terms of how this is going to work. So I'm really um, just, I think, channeling my own concern that the commission stays in above the fray that is occurring at the public policy level. And I think Chris's presentation demonstrates that, um, you know, look, this is this horse has left the barn. Something's going to happen. The legal services community has to debate internally about how to handle the law that's already passed. And now the commission has to figure out a way to sort of gracefully slide in to an administrative role to interface with the legal services community and the governor's office in administering these funds. And given how unprescriptive it is at this point, there's a lot of wiggle room for things to take shape in ways that the commission doesn't really have control over. And to me, that gives me some pause because I just don't want to put the commission in a place where it's vested with a bunch of responsibility and no authority. And that's where my head is going. And I, we're not there yet. Nothing's happened that's bad. But, you know, I'm just sort of projecting out into the future. And I think this commission committee will end up keeping us apprised of all the most recent developments, help direct staff, et cetera, in a very helpful way. And that's what we've learned over the last, let's say four months as we've become a little bit more involved. Uh, Juan and then the Yeah, I, I just really- Forgive me. I, I, I think my position may have been misunderstood. Give me one minute or even less. I think we have enhanced services with social workers, whatever. That is a wonderful contribution, okay? So there could be something very good in a care plan. So when, they, when when you say there's nothing new under the sun, well, if you have the services yeah. beyond what the public defendant does, that is new. Fair, fair point. Uh, Thank you for clarifying. Go ahead, Dwan. Uh, yeah, I just want to say, um, we had mentioned at the last presentation, the commission meeting, that this was quite controversial in the legal aid community. I did want to, um, to, to mention this to you. You haven't already heard of news. There is pending litigation around the CARE Act um, initiated by our programs, our, a couple QSPs, a support center, I believe Black Sound on as amicus brief. Um, I could send you an article after that's, if you Google it, it's, it's in the news, um, but I can send you something after if you want to read more about it. Lauren? Yeah, I just would second what Don said that I think some of the, the tension you're said, sensing is because the legal aid community did feel so strongly opposed to this plan. And now that it has passed, there's a lot of things about it that they don't like, and a lot of things that are unclear. So I just, you know, I would like to commend State Bar staff for having to figure out how to put an unclear, not always well thought out plan into action. Um, they're having over backwards to figure out how to make this work and to make it work for a legal aid community that never supported the plan in the first place. So it's a difficult situation that we are all making the best of, and we're appreciative of State Bar staff for um, working so closely with us on it. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Will, go ahead. I just wanted to get clarification. It sounds like that whether we commit, create a committee or not, staff will have to spend the time planning for the contingencies based on what budget we might get. So the major, so we're not going to save any money by not creating the committee. We just get efficiency and that we don't have to have the full commission meet. Is that I understanding accurate? I, I put a little bit of a finer point on it. By establishing a committee, we're essentially vesting a, a group of commissioners to work with staff to be involved in the process and then to report back to the full commission. I think the benefit of that is really that staff then has the sort of imprimatur of the full commission through the committee to get direction and guidance in a way that right now they don't have. And I think there's a little a level of discomfort that they'd be making decisions um, without anybody from the commission sort of weighing in. So to me, this sort of formalizes a process that will keep the full commission 
better informed about how things are are developing. And and, and I think the commission next meets in June, maybe. But I could see us needing a touch, few couple of touch points between yeah. now and then. Yeah, when the budget, if the budget act, uh, excuse me, the budget bill doesn't come out till mid June, like I think yeah. the week before the commission meets or something like that. Yeah, and just to be clear, the resolution to, to to be clear, like it's not an endorsement of the public underlying public policy or really any sort of act to to occur um, in, in within the legal services community, whether their litigation is successful or how and who applies for funds, et cetera. It's really just to ensure that the commission has a a, a voice um, and a sort of an eye on the process. That's how would I see you, it. Would you still like me to read the resolution out loud, Christian? I don't I don't think we need to. I think everybody can see it there. Um, but we do have a motion in a second, and I will just uh, go ahead and think we should call roll and proceed. Officer Roth? Yes. Connolly? Connolly? I thought I saw Eric on, but okay. Yeah, there. sorry. I couldn't get to unmute. Uh, no, sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> Too many monitors. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Agogi? So torn on this. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm abstaining on this one. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Uh, yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Gawkin? Abstain. Iskin? Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Vargas? Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. So, okay, just logistically, are we soliciting at this stage members of the commission to, to sit on this committee? Yes, we need we need um, three or four commissioners um, and two, we'll, we'll end up having two doing the scoring, but we do need about three or four um, so we can brainstorm. So if you if you would like to volunteer, um, please either drop me an email or give me a call afterwards. You don't have to do it at this moment. Or if you need yeah. more information, Chris and I are happy to meet with you. Yeah, I will just say Judge Klein is raising his hand. So let's just oh, consider great. him to be volunteered. Catherine as well. Yes. And I, I'm happy to do it also. So okay, wonderful. Oh, thank you, Judge oh, Klein. Oh, Eric too. I think I saw Eric. Was that your hand? Yeah. Then? Oh, hands up. Everybody wants to sit on the new committee. That's a great committee. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate it. I I yeah, thank you. We'll see, you know, we'll see. But having um, some thoughtful people involved um, from the commission will be uh, an, a, a good addition. So thank you. And I think it'll hopefully help staff. Um, so thanks. Uh, all right, let's take a five minute break and, I, and I'm gonna stick to the five. So I will be back in five minutes, but just you can go off camera and bio break and then I'll see you shortly and we'll pick it back up with Catherine's report. Peeling back in. There we go. Thanks, everybody, for taking a break and coming back timely. And we're just going to move on to the next agenda item. So, Catherine, please give us the update. Oh, you're on mute. You think I'd learn. Um, anyway, um, I we're going to be talking about the uh, decisions of the eligibility and budget review committee. Erica and I are going to co-present and I believe she has some slides that will do a summary of the background and then we'll talk about the actions a really terrific committee took. So um, take it away, Erica. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, <clears throat> so the first item uh, from the eligibility and budget review committee that will be looking at are the 2022 IELTA and EAF budget revisions and carryover requests that were above 25% of the award. Um, so for newer members of the commission or those who haven't handled 
um, these types of items before, just some background when grantees need to make a budget revision um, or they haven't been able to spend down their award in the current grant year and want to carry some forward to the next year. Um, we have a process for them to submit those requests and <clears throat> there are guidelines depending on, on how large the request is about who needs to review and improve it. So if it's a request below 10% of the grant award, that's considered self-executing and doesn't need review. Um, it receives automatic approval. Between 10 and 25% of the grant award needs to come through staff and needs to be approved by the director of the Office of Access and Inclusion. Um, and then anything that would be above 25% of the grant award uh, requires commission approval. So um, when carryover requests come through historically, um, the period for the carryover is six months. So through June 30th of the next year, um, there have been exceptions made to that in the past, uh, most notably in 2020, the commission allowed a 12 month carryover period um, because of the pandemic. Um, and then the most recent exception to that was back in December, I believe the commission voted to allow a 12 month carryover for just the 2022 EAF funds for those that are approved. Um, and the reasoning for that was that the 2022 EAF grant awards were very large. Um, they almost tripled compared to the 2021 awards. Um, and grantees were allowed to submit a two-year budget at the outset, um, but many of them didn't. So for those that hadn't requested a two-year budget in fairness to, to those who weren't able to spend down, um, the, the decision was made to allow a 12-month carryover period for EAF. So just wanted to note the difference between IELTA, which is six months, and EAF, which is 12. Um, and then <clears throat> in terms of carryover amounts, um, again, in the past few years, there's been a lot of flexibility around this. Uh, grantees were allowed to carry over very, very large amounts in 2020. Um, and we saw uh, a number of grantees request very large carryovers in 2021 as well. Um, after uh, the 2021 year and seeing those large carryover requests, there was some concern about um, grantees attempting to create a reserve or or not focusing on spending funds in the year awarded. Um, and so there was a change to that approach where the commission uh, passed a resolution that that sort of more recent flexibility would no longer be accorded um, and that grantees with very large carryovers would essentially receive um, greater scrutiny. Um, again, in the context of large 2022 EAF awards, um, staff's approach, which was shared with the committee was that um, even if it's a very large carryover that um, we recommended approval at the time, um, just because uh, again, some grantees had already been approved for a two year budget. And so giving uh, these grantees requesting carryover the same, the same benefit or opportunity to do that. Um, so in terms of specific organizations that came in above 25% of the grant award for budget revisions, um, we had four that uh, had budget revisions needing approval. Um, I think with these three organizations, sort of the main themes of why they needed budget revisions were um, hiring difficulties, um, changes to their program activities. So, um, you know, perhaps seeing less demand for something than they expected and needing to attribute funds to a new activity um, and uh, new funding streams. So sometimes uh, grantees received funding they hadn't anticipated when they budgeted originally, and so needed to reallocate their um, expenditures. Um, and then as far as carryover requests, uh, there were four that had uh, carryover requests for EAF um, and two organizations for IOLTA um, that needed committee review and commission approval. Um, again, uh, I think for a lot of these organizations, some of it was hiring challenges or retention challenges. Um, some of them, <clears throat> excuse me, had, um, uh, actually, I think that was probably the biggest reasoning. Some of them also had um, changes to the, their space costs. So some of them thought they were gonna be renting space that they didn't wind up renting, um, things like that. So um, I'll hand it over to Catherine to talk a little bit about the committee discussion and the resolution. So um, the committee is recommending approval of all of the IOLTA EAF uh, budget re revisions. 
um, in excess of the 25% of the grant award that uh, is just reflected in the attachment that you um, just saw. And in addition, approving all of the 2020 IOLTA and EAF um, requests in excess of 25% of the grant award. Um, IOLTA funds have to be spent by June 30th, 2023, and EAF funds have to be spent by December 31st, 2023. Um, <clears throat> The, the reasoning for that, we had good discussions, I thought, with all of the grantees. Um, you saw a chart that showed both the EAF amounts, which were significantly larger, and those really fall under the for programs that did not have previously requested a two-year budget to give them the opportunity to have that same flexibility that was given to other programs. And then there were smaller um, IOLTA amounts that were... Um, uh, that we're recommending be approved. Um, we also uh, wanted to be clear that starting um, with the next year's grant award, that there be a more specific question by which grantees provided detailed information regarding their plans to spend both the carry forward and the current year grant award so that we could, um, so that staff could um, have that information as part of the approval uh, process. There is a, a question that was in the 2022 application that staff looked at um, uh, that staff requested, uh, it wasn't always at, answered in, with particular detail. And so this is an effort to get more detailed information to make this uh, process go more smoothly in the future. So anyway, that is um, that is our, our proposal on this. Are there any questions of people? Eric? No, I mean, just an observation. I mean, the carryover amounts are pretty staggering. Well, those are for the EAF. I think there's two different ones, right? We should go back and look at them. So there's EAF amounts that are the highest, which are yeah, 6971, right? Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Yeah. And that's that's that sort of flexibility because of that what um Erica mm -hmm. described is like a tripling of the equal access funds and programs had been given flexibility for a two-year budget, but not all of them took advantage of that. Hmm. So, so this is to give those programs, sort of put them back on the level footing with the programs that requested the two-year um, hmm. cycle. And anyway, that but you're right, there are large amounts and it's it was driven by the large amount of the EAF request. I mean, the EAF funding, sorry. You can go ahead, Selena. And just a reminder for the newer commissioners, the legislature actually also gave greater flexibility to spend that money over a longer period. And so that's why programs had the flexibility is because it was part of the budget language. Will? And the for these large amounts, the grantees indicated that they feel confident they can spend down within the time frame? They said they were confident they could spend down and if they can't spend All by right. December, 2023, the money reverts to the commission. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we, I mean, we do have a, um, you know, a Asian Law Caucus, um, Advanced Justice, they've, they're a repeat player here in, in terms of the, uh, last commission meeting. So, I mean, I think we're seeing some of these, some pretty consistent themes here uh, in the community. Yeah, I think we specifically had a discussion. I, I asked exactly the question you asked about Asian Law Caucus. We had a discussion with them about, about the repetition, and I think they have clarity about that. We'll see whether that changes. Um, what happens in the future. And that's part of the reason for the more detailed request to get information about where where programs yeah. are. The other thing I'd note, uh, oh, and then Eric, which is just for Ephraim and patients, both of whom probably don't even need to be told this, but you know, the there is this, I don't think it's really a tension in the community, but or in the on the commission, which is that we often are told to try to 
prioritize funding to rural parts of the state, underserved parts of the state. And it's an endemic problem that those parts of the state are also um, the ones that have the biggest problem recruiting and retaining attorneys to do the work. So you do see, you know, Bakersfield and Inland Empire, the the mid coast um, places that to to you know, as Jim Meeker would note, you know, are more rural than people think, and so it is something that we see. But in any event, uh, Eric, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering. So, to the extent that any of these organizations also apply for funding under our discretionary programs, under our RFPs. Do we make, when we evaluate, do we get this, did this data of carryovers or experience of carryovers, at least for those that are frequent flyers in that respect, do we make note of that when we look at the RFP application? They don't seem to be able to spend their money or don't budget well or stuff like that. I'm just wondering if we, if the, if the data gets, if we're connecting the dots between these programs. <clears throat> in I will let staff comment. In my experience, we have been one of, I mean, it's not an express item in the rubric uh, for most of the competitive funding grants. Uh, but one of the ways that I think it comes in is um, organizational structure, or I, I can't remember the actual title, but there's basically a a category, as you well remember, probably, Eric, you know, does the organization have sort of the wherewithal to actually carry out the plan that they're, that they are applying for money to, you know, to, to do. And so I think it comes into play there. I know we've considered it uh, with other organizations that have had historical problems with leadership within the organization, you know, in that category. You know, I'm in the camp with um, Eric on this. Mm -hmm. If there's a way that we can incorporate this information, I mean, it's over $1.35 million that's being carried over. There's so much need, so much need. And um, I think we need to, to have more insight as we're looking at these grant applications. So if there is a way to be able to uh, add in the information that Eric just asked about, which I think is very important, I understand that you know there are uh, parameters, as Selena just mentioned, that these carryovers have been uh, granted to them, but 1.35 million, it's... I'm, I've got to say, I'm not comfortable with that. And I understand that these carryovers uh, are here present before us. Catherine? So I, uh, two things. I, I think we have to distinguish between the equal access carry forwards, which are the very highest amount that get us, you know, over a, like up to a million at least, because these programs now have the same flexibility that the legislature authorized, which is to spend the money over two years. And it was staff's recommendation that as a matter of fairness, even though they didn't ask for a two-year budget, that we essentially give them the two-year budget that um, could would put them in the same place as the other programs. So that was really the reason that the money was that that large the largest amounts of money are carried over, but it's to put people in parity with the other um, with the other programs. The other thing to to say, I guess, two things. One to say I share the concern about, you know, there's large amounts of money, and where we don't want to be is having programs not be able to spend the money that they're going to spend this year's money through 2023, and then they're going to be coming in and asking for a significant carry forward for the next year. And so part of the request was that when programs asking for a carry forward, that they not only talk about how they're going to spend the carry forward, but how they're also going to spend the next year's grant so that we're not in a kind of perpetual carry forward kind of place. So that was part of the discussion the committee had and that was the request that when that 
question on the application was revised, revi uh, revised that it includes specifically about spending future year money in addition to the current carry forward so that we could make more informed decisions about about everything that was happening for that program in terms of the ability to spend the money. And then just to the to uh, the last point, um, having recently reviewed some of the applications from a discretionary grant, I, 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 I kind of think it was in the administrative uh, area, like your capacity to administer the program. And there's there was specific information provided to the review committee about whether you had timely submitted information, whether you had carry forward request, et cetera. So, and I think that staff did that in response to commissions con, uh, questions about just the capacity of the organization to manage yet another grant. And I think that was very helpful for those of us that were reviewing um, the grant that, that I was on and um, helped us make better uh, decisions about organizational capacity. So those are my, my other comments. Um, Selena, and then we'll go ahead and vote on the uh, resolution. But go ahead, Selena. This is a, a quick public policy argument, but it, it's a good news one. Is that I heard from several programs, uh, and and I think every commissioner knows this, that IOLTA funds in particular are so flexible that when organizations create their budget, and as we've talked about these increasing IOLTA budgets, you know. Right now, organizations who are on a fiscal year of July to June are already making their budgets with guesses of what you will grant them for 2024. Um, so some of these carriers are, are, are because organizations still don't know what their grants are like, likely to be in the following year. And so they can't hire and quickly spend the money and they have to really rely on that flexible um, the flexible use of the funds when there's a shifting um, grant amount. But just a real quick example is several programs have said that when they um, have the opportunity to apply for new funding for um, a project that's actually currently funded by IOLTA, um, there is a worry that if the, you know, if the IOLTA Commission says, oh, well, no, you can't carry it over, then they um, it could perhaps serve as a disincentive to looking for new funding for existing programs. And some organizations are getting foundations who may support some of the programs that, that your funds currently fund. So um, just a note that, that some of the reasons why organizations request carryovers is because they've actually found new sources of revenue, not that they can't hire or another reason. And, and I heard this more from the folks in the 11 to 24% carryover. Um, so that does happen and it is a, a real reason. And I wouldn't want those organizations to say, oh, we're not gonna look for new funding for this because IELTS already pays for it. Uh, okay, we've got a resolution on the screen, and Erica, I don't, has everybody, we can read that out loud if, if need be, but go ahead. Um, if. Sure, happy to do that. Um, the resolution is resolved. The Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approves all 2022 IOLTA and EAF budget revision requests in excess of 25% of the grant award as reflected in attachment B to the memorandum. And it is further resolved, the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approves all 2022 IOLTA and EAF carryover requests in excess of 25% of the grant award. As reflected in attachment B to the memorandum, IOLTA funds not spent by June 30th, 2023, and EAF funds not spent by uh, December 31st, 2023 must be returned to the state bar. So I make a motion to approve this uh, resolution. Second. Hey, thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Patience. Yeah. I'll go ahead with the roll. Paul Saroff? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Oglagi? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Yes. Boschelli? Yes. Campbell? <coughs> yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. <clears throat> King? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Vargas? Schreiber? Yes. 
motion passes. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Oh, Chris, Erica has her hand up. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Erica. Hi, sorry, this may have already come up and I apologize if I miss it, but just I just wanted to flag that like the rules committee is considering um, where we're working as a working group on sort of budget and carryover stuff. So if anyone has, um, you know, views on that and when the rules committee actually puts forward its proposal, like highly recommend that, um, you know, folks um, can come check out our um, our meeting that day and, you know, for example, trying to incorporate some of the information between different discretionary grants just sort of plugging that because um we've obviously been working on it and want to make sure we get it right and, uh, well i guess what i can do because this the budget revisions carry over have such like wide implication i can i can circulate um the working group memo that went to um black right now i mean after this meeting um so you all and then if you want to either pass along feedback or go to the rules committee when that's up then um, you're welcome to that'd be great Thank you. Okay, it's six two, six point two. Uh, sorry, it's, um, we're back to Erica, who's going to go through this. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so the second item from the eligibility and budget review committee had to do with um, budget deviations from prior years, from twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty one, um, that hadn't been disclosed to the state bar or the commission until um, we conducted monitoring visits in twenty twenty two. Um, so there were three organizations that um, were implicated uh, in, um, in the course of conducting our monitoring visits last year, Child Care Law Center, Greater Bakersfield Legal Assistance, and Inland Empire Latino Lawyers Association. Um, in, with these three organizations, they either didn't submit a budget deviation at the time it occurred, or they submitted something, but not through our normal channels. And so it didn't come to our attention right away. So Child Care Law Center, instead of requesting a budget deviation, we received an attachment to their um, fourth quarter expense report that um, you know didn't come to our attention immediately when it happened. Um, with Greater Bakersfield and with Inland Empire, they um, were not necessarily aware that they had deviated enough in some of these instances to require them to submit another budget revision. Um, and so staff is working with those organizations to provide some technical assistance and make sure they are aware of the requirements going um, forward. Um, we had um, originally, uh, staff had recommended when writing up our monitoring memos that the organizations return the funds because they had not sought um, approval from the commission. Um, after reading responses from the organizations and having discussions with them, um, staff changed its recommendation uh, to allow the organizations because they did spend the money and we were convinced that it was on qualifying activities that they not return the money, but that the three organizations receive a warning um, that in the future, if something like this were to recur, that they would be required to return funds to the state bar. So, um, so our recommendation to the committee had been to approve these budget deviations, even though they're very belated um, and that the the three organizations be provided that warning for um, to set their expectations in the future. And um, I think Catherine will give a little bit of an overview of the, the discussion. So um, the the recommendation is to approve the, that staff, recommend, uh, staff recommendation. Um, we also ask that staff um, <clears throat> consider providing uh, feedback for the codification process related to budget deviations, much like Erica was um, suggesting. So thanks for that, Erica. Um, for example, changing the five-day reporting requirement for budget deviations to perhaps something that's uh, quarterly. I think it's, I, I think most programs don't recall that you're supposed to do something within five days and it's helpful to sort of come up with a realistic process that works for staff and, um, and for programs. Um, and we supported the uh, recommendation also that uh, these programs receive a warning given the, the late period of time that um, the information was received. We also spoke to all, all of the grantees um, and they all confirmed for us as they had for staff that they are establishing safeguards to avoid this issue in the future. So that's the, uh, the recommendation is to our recommendation to the commission is to approve what staff had originally recommended, 
um, approving it, but uh, providing a warning that um, unreported uh, budget deviations will not be approved in the in the future. Um, Erica, go ahead. Yeah, um, just out of curiosity, did was there anything that did you get any feedback from the organizations about kind of what happened? Yeah. Um, so I, at least in two of the instances, they essentially said that, I mean, especially if I think if you looked at Inland Empire, theirs was actually, had it been done on time, it could have been staff approved. Like they just didn't realize that they had reached the level um, to trigger the requirement to submit that request. Um, and then Greater Bakersfield, I believe they mentioned that they, they had protocols in place, but perhaps weren't um, completely consistent in following them. Um, and I think um, something that staff had highlighted at the committee level was that organizations sometimes experience confusion about um, sort of how to calculate their percentage deviation, which is something mm -hmm. that I believe is uh, something staff would like to, to raise through that codification process to assist yeah. grantees. Um, so I, I think that's part of it too, um, that some organizations just are, are not always um, up to date or clear on, on how to calculate that for themselves in order to notify us. Um, and a lot of these requests come through at the end of the year when, when sort of everybody's kind of making their, their last um, requests. So um, for those that would need to do it uh, more than once or earlier in the year, I think we can provide a little bit better guidance on that. Great. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Go ahead, Juan. Yeah, I just want to say we do fully acknowledge that the budget revision kind of request process and how it's calculated is confusing to programs, um, and and that's we acknowledge that, and that, and that's why we um, we're working through it in the codification process. So, and that's one of the reasons why we went back on our recommendation. I think I'm just a little confused yeah. though. What? How did the 2020 not come up until now? Um, I think that was their carryover amounts. So they hadn't, um, you know, we received in 2020, when we conduct monitoring visits, we're looking at the prior year. So in 2022, we were looking at their 2021 expenditures. Um, and so for those organizations that had 2020 carryover, we were then looking at, at it through the monitoring visit for that time period. So those, it was a 2020 grant, but it was actually spent in 2021. Or I see, so in 2021. So this isn't an issue where there's like a modification that happened back in 2020 and never got reported. It's right. just with funds. Okay, perfect. I just had a little confusion on that. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Catherine. I'll just quickly say, I think one of the, my observations is the state bar staff now have increased fiscal staff that are directly doing the monitoring visits and they have a much more skilled set of how it's supposed to work. And that had not really been the always the practice of the of the bar that was using some contract staff that were not um, as familiar with the requirements. And so I think that some of this is because the state bar staff is doing a better job directly what is of monitoring to the requirements and um, that that um, has brought to people's attention the ways they're supposed to be doing things which would not have been brought to their attention before. No, that's exactly right. We used to have one fiscal staff and now we have four and on purpose we hired two with auditing backgrounds. So our, our monitoring is just more robust and more thorough is part of it. Sorry, I do have one last question. When you talk about the warning, what, what are you sort of envisioning? Is it like a letter that would go to them or? Okay. Um, in the, the motion, um, you know, we recommended that you provide them with a warning and we can, I guess, format that however you like, whether you want it to be a formal letter or staff can provide that to them separately. Uh, uh, we've done that before, you know, if an organization, even if they were in attendance at a meeting, we would follow up with an email and let them know that, you know, this motion was passed and it affects you in however uh, many ways. Um, so I think that's what we were originally envisioning, but if you would like it to be something more formal than that, we can can do that. Do, do we, our earlier um, attendee, 
Uh, Cindy, still on the line or? Um, she okay. might be, but they were not necessarily implicated yeah. in this. That's I a different, know. I think that's a different issue. It is, yeah, okay. Um, okay, let's do this resolution. Chris, I have one question, please. Oh, go ahead. Oh, there it is. Sorry, Bottashe. No worries. So yep. do we know, the staff know if uh, if we could go back to the, the other slide, mm -hmm. please. Thank you. Does this, this uh, staff know if uh, Child Care Law Center, Greater Bakersfield Legal Assistance, Inland Empire Latino Lawyers Association, have had a similar problem in the past prior to 2020? Um, I'm not sure about that. I, I mean, I think as we were just discussing in terms of where we have more robust procedures now regarding fiscal oversight. Um, Eric, I, I can answer that question quickly because they were actually in my program for a number of years and I went on modern business and it, it was all clean, but again, the, the, the fiscal side, we ramped it up, and these are related, fiscal related, but on the program side, they've never had a serious finding. So we don't know from an oversight whether there were any fiscal issues prior to 2020? I, I wouldn't call it an oversight. I mean, it's just our, we built out the processes for our fiscal. Um, so part of it is new processes and what we're checking and- And, and what we're checking but, but, that, but in terms of the, the carryover in the budget, I think that that probably would have surfaced, but other things that we check for now, I, I can't speak to that, that we have to go back and itemize that for you and let you know how, how it's being done now. I think one of the things to answer to Erica's question, what's gonna be in that letter, should there be any information prior to 2019? I think you wanna memorialize that in the letter as well to show that this is, we've given them more than ample enough time to get it right. Catherine? I should say my impression is because, and maybe it's just an impression, is that there, because it was a different fiscal process to review these grantees, that there were not any prior findings that um, related to this because they didn't do the monitoring in the same way relative to this issue. So I'm, I'm perfectly happy if someone wants them to check and confirm that, but I, I just think... I think, Catherine, I appreciate that, but I think it's our duty, oversight duty, yeah, yeah. to know that. So if you can uh, look into that for us, that would be great. Thank you. You know, what, what we can do is, um, if, you, if you would like us to apply kind of the standard that we're doing now, and then go back one monitoring visit or two monitoring visits for the three at hand that will have a warning, we can include if if we would have found something. That um, but but again, I, I think off the top of my head, the Child Care Law Center specifically has been my program for a number of years until lately, um, and they've never had a serious issue. I understand program programmatically, but if you can, just one or two back, that would be great. Shall we? Catherine Shall we has her hand. Up. I'm sorry. I, I like we did a monitor. I'm fine going back and saying, were there findings about a program? But to go back and re audit something using in, using a tool that we didn't use in those prior years, like I feel like that creates for programs kind of uncertainty. Like once you have a monitoring visit, and you have your fiscal report, you should be able to rely on that information and to go back and apply a, the, the current tool to prior year's visits and re-audit on something. I, 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 that's not, that's, that's what, I think we're, we're not uh, on the same page, Catherine. That's okay. not what I'm asking for. Okay. What I'm asking for is have these three, we're looking at them going back to 2020, yeah. Have these three had any budget deviation issues in the past? I think from our perspective, and it's really to the point that Erica Conley brought up, and I think it's a, a, a good one. You know, how are we going to, um, how are we going to write this letter? Is it just a, you know, a, a slap on the back of the hand? Don't do this again. And I don't think that's what we can do with these types of funds that we're overseeing. But it's to really find out how what is the what is their um, 
how do the numbers run? Is this a, a pattern? Is this something that we need to be aware of? Obviously, this group right now can see that these these three folks uh, organizations at least have a, a problem as it, as it relates to 2020. We need to keep uh, on top of it. And, and for those of us who are, you know, uh, charming off this year, I think it's I, I want to really highlight and underscore what our role is here. And it's not to, uh, you know, this, this isn't money that anyone, any organization uh, has to have. These funds are um, here for the work, the good work that they need to do. So I, I just wanna really underscore that oversight is key and not to, not to, you know, between this and the last couple of the, the uh, slides, I'm I'm concerned how we're 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 doing things here. So I, I'm I'm rising, raising a flag of of we need to do a bit more. Um, and I'm sorry for the confusion. I wasn't imagining doing a full like fiscal monitor like sweep again for all three. I was just yeah. Going to direct the staff. If, if you, all, if I'll take your cue from the commission to just look at the issue of the carryover and budget revisions for just the Ielton EF. So very contained, but not a full fiscal monitoring visit. So and I, you I and apologize I are on for the, Yeah, we're on the same page, Juan. That's um, what I'm thinking about. I don't think. I mean, I guess my concern is if it wasn't brought to the program's attention prior to twenty, they had a monitoring visit. These programs would have had a visit, I think, in 2017 if they had one in 2020, because it's a three-year cycle. So they got a report from all of you that said their fiscal work was fine. There were no findings. To now go back and say, now we're going to look at 2017, which was your last monitoring visit, and we're going to tell you, no, it wasn't fine because there's we're just looking at these two columns and now there's budget deviations that weren't acceptable that I think that's a problem. We're going to go, we're going to go back to 2017 and make a different conclusion and well, hold them <clears throat> and, and add to a letter something that we didn't bring to their attention in 2017 because our staff didn't, the, the trust fund staff didn't look at it in the same way. I, I don't, I, I'm opposed to that. I'm sorry. I agree going forward, and I, I believe in oversight, and I believe the letter, the intention of this letter was to say, if this issue occurs in the future, there's going to be consequences to that, but to go retroactive to make, st I, I don't, we already made a conclusion about 2017. So Angie, anything? Uh, I totally agree with Catherine. And, and besides, what good does it do to rake it up again? I mean, we've got three years of data. Now we're working on it. Now we go forward. Our mission is to try to help these people, not to punish them. Right. So, okay, do you want any last words here before I... Yeah, I, I was going to say, maybe as a compromise, if I can suggest, if we want, don't want to go backward, another option is we can issue the monitoring visit letter and then like, we, monitoring visits happen every three years, but we can do something like maybe low stakes next year, uh, like a abbreviated monitoring visit just on the fiscal piece. So something, if, if you want to like oversee a little bit more closely instead of waiting till the next monitoring visit. And we've done that before through EBR. Um, that's something that they typically, a, another tool that they use, but it is a forward looking um, to make sure they have the processes. This is, they're on track. Patience, did you have a suggestion in that regard? I would love to see us take a different tone. Um, I I don't know Child Care Law Center. I don't know Inland Empire, um, but I know uh, I know Greater Bakersfield, and um, there's nobody on this call that cares more about using this money well to serve clients than Estela. So I think it would be super helpful rather than we gotcha and you know you failed here to offer like to find out what happened and it sounds like Catherine and her committee made some inroads into finding out what had happened but also how can we help 
I mean, I, I wonder whether it makes sense to send staff in to do a supplemental, you know, next year an abbreviated one, bless you for even suggesting it, but my God, like you, you're already understaffed, you got nothing better to do. And I, I, if we're going to spend staff time around this, I would love to see it be like, how can we as a trust fund commission support you? What, what additional resources do you need? What training do you need? I mean, my God, you put a lawyer in a job as an administrator, and sometimes it's a brilliant match, and sometimes it's, um, you know, a vertical learning curve. So um, Estella has been doing this for a long time. So obviously she's, you know, I'm not saying she doesn't know what she's doing. It's just, it would be great if the Trust Fund Commission approached this with um, a, a default assumption that everyone is dancing as fast as they can. And how can we, um, how can we as a Trust Fund Commission, what, what, what went wrong here? Because we all want to see this money spent for the client's benefit. Everybody wants that. Everybody wants that. So how do we how do we ensure that, and how can we help you get there? Um, okay. Um, sorry, sorry, patience. So given the time, we've got four committee reports with, or excuse me, three committee, four committee reports, four resolutions to vote on. Thirty five minutes. I'm going to bring this uh, discussion to a close, and get to the resolution, which we need to vote on. Um, in terms of directing staff, I think at, at a minimum, we have to, to act prospectively with respect to this organization. We do have form letters. Um, and I would say, why don't we plan on a June committee, a, a June agenda item to sort of catch up on any communications that have occurred between now and um, and the June meeting to see if further whether it's retrospective or more punitive action is is necessary what staff recommends i don't think duan or bonnerche is suggesting that we go back all the way to 2017 and do a fiscal audit using today's um, standards but i don't think there's um, any call to vote on that issue at the moment but for for now we have to decide whether or not to approve this and then i think there is a general agreement that everybody's going to end up getting some sort of a letter here de describing the deviation. And if there's additional action required in June, let's talk about it then. So uh, I'll entertain a motion on the resolution that's on the screen. And if we can vote on that, that'd be great. Catherine moves. Okay. Thank you. Patience. Seconds. Okay, go ahead. Alsaroff? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Oglogi? Abstain. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Yes. Boschelli? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. <clears throat> King? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Abstain. Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Vargas? Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, uh, let's move on to Jim, uh, Chris and Jennifer, and being mindful of the time and your budgeted 20 minutes and the fact that we probably don't have that, but uh, take it away. And Chris, I think that's you perhaps share, is that you sharing? Oh, Jennifer. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to unmute myself. Okay, here we go. <laughs> So um, item 7.1 is to approve the HP2 and HP3 budget revision requests. Okay, so each year organizations that receive HP grant funding have an opportunity to, re to revise their grant budgets. Erica explained the review thresholds for grants during the EBR presentation, which are also listed on this slide. Um, suffice it to say that those same thresholds apply to HP. 
Staff received 23 requests for budget revisions, five for HP2 formula, one for HP2 competitive, 12 for HP3 formula, and five for HP3 competitive. Because of time, I'll skip to the request requiring commission approval. Um, and I do have uh, the posted materials, but I'm just gonna read through it really quickly. Um, so Asian Americans Advancing Justice Southern California's HP3 formula request was 17.58%, which can be approved by staff, but they reduced their total personnel allocation to 60.2% due to hiring challenges and the need to allocate funds to contract services. Staff and the HP Funds Committee recommend that the commission approve this personnel deviation. Uh, then we have four requests, which were over 25% and therefore require commission approval. These requests were for Child Care Law Center's HP2 formula grant. They requested a 40.5% budget revision. Child Care Law Center's HP3 formula grant requesting a 26.47% budget revision. Public Council's HP3 formula grant requesting a 45% budget revision. And Public Council's HP3 for a competitive grant, excuse me, which was 48.53% budget revision. Um, to summarize CCLC's revision requests, they had some staffing issues. Uh, additionally, their HP2 formula grant deviates slightly below the 75% personnel threshold, but this was true of their original grant budget as well. And this budget revision actually increases their personnel allocation to 73.4%. Um, so the committee recommends approving the revision request for CCLC, including the deviation below the 75% personnel threshold. Moving on to public counsel, both their HP3 formula and HP3 competitive budget revisions requests are somewhat unique. This is because in addition to requesting to move money between budget items and years, as is typical of such requests, they also seek to reduce the overall amount of funds distributed to both grants. Uh, public counsel's HP3 formula award, which is $2,619,000, um, but they are now asking for $1,433,183. This equals a 45% budget revision and a budget reduction of $1,167,136 or 44.88%. Similarly, their HP3 competitive award is $1,100,000 and they are now asking for $537,397. This equals a 48.53% budget revision and a budget reduction of $562,603 or 51. Jennifer, I'm sorry to interrupt and I'm not sure. Um, are you supposed to be showing something that we're following? Yeah, was, the numbers yeah. are, are hard to follow. I'm sorry. To yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to save time, but I can go to that for public counsel. So public counsel, we have. Can you make it larger? Sorry. Yeah. Yes, I can. Uh, where is that? Okay. And just maybe go uh, a little bit slower about the public council piece because I think people. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to save time. They're large. No, numbers. it's, it's yeah. okay. Is that large enough now? Maybe like two clicks. Thank you, Jennifer. Yeah. Okay. So, public council, their HP3 formula was $2,600,319. Um, they're now asking for $1,433,183. Um, again, this equals a 45% budget revision. However, you'll see a star here that indicates that the budget reduction is $1,167,136 or 44.88%. So those numbers aren't the same, right, as what you just put on the screen. That's true. Uh, those numbers aren't the same because the typical budget revisions account for changes between line items as well as years for multi-year grants. However, for public counsel, they're also asking for a reduction. So now if we go to public counsel's um, competitive, um, sorry, I just lost my place. So Public Council's HP3 Competitive Award is $1,100,000. They are now asking for $537,397. This equals a 48.53% budget revision, 
and a budget reduction of $562,603 or 51.15%. So again, you see the revision amount and percentage with the asterisks, which lead um, to a footnote indicating the different reduction percentage. Public Council attributes their request for a reduction in the overall amount of funds to difficulties hiring attorneys and lower demands for services, which they outline in attachment C of the memo. This attachment also details their requested deliverables modification for both grants. Attachment B provides further details about their budget revision request. Um, staff recommend approving Public Council's HP3 formula and HP3 competitive budget revisions and deliverables modif modification requests because the deliverables have been lowered proportionately to the proposed budget revisions. However, staff also acknowledged that some of the deliverables seem low. Importantly, their original applications were approved and provided similarly proportionate deliverables, even if they were somewhat vague. Um, specifically, I'm referring to public council's HP3 formula deliverables, um, which propose 12 cases filed in 2023 and 15 cases filed in 2024, as well as three know your rights presentations per quarter, two tenant organization meetings per quarter, one community legal clinic per quarter, and direct legal services as needed. As public counsel note, they will, quote, be able to maintain these deliverables while decreasing the budget because the direct legal services do not have a numerical goal, end quote. Um, so with this in mind, the committee recommends approving public counsel's budget revisions and deliverable modifications, and staff will continue to work with public counsel to ensure they are maximizing these grant dollars as much as possible. Uh, Joseph has his um, hand up. I see it. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so at the risk of asking kind of an obvious question, if we approve this reduction, I'm just getting my head around the concept of a grant recipient saying, please give me less money. I, 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 I don't see that every day. And so sure. what happens to the money that effectively is being returned? It just goes into the general funds to be reallocated in future years to other applicants, I gather? Uh, not for question. This. Yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. Oh, please. sorry. Um, not for this. These are federal dollars. And um, Chris will mention in agenda item 7.3 that um, staff are proposing that we reallocate um, unspent HP3 funds um, ahead, ahead of schedule so that we can redistribute them to HP3 grant recipients and not have to give back to the federal government. Understood. Okay, yeah, that's a that's an important thing, I think, for folks to understand, right? Yes. All right, and, thank you. Um, sure, and public counsel, I believe, is um, here in case there are questions, but uh, I see Banache. So um, I'm sure this is gonna come in Chris's uh, Chris's uh, presentation, but what's realistic in terms of timing to be able to reallocate the funds? Sure, so um, the plan is to start thinking about that uh, pretty soon and to give grantees a full year and a half, so halfway through the three-year grant, and then to do a quick redistribution so that there is um, as much time as possible for um, other grantees who take on additional funds to spend down. Thank you. Um, if there are no other questions, um, we can move forward. I don't know. Yeah, let's. Okay. So this is the proposed resolution. I, I just want to say, like, I, I know there's like a lot of numbers and public council's kind of unique situation. I, I, I just want to reassure the commission that the HP funds committee had a really like thoughtful discussion about this and read through their letter. And like this resolution was like heavily wordsmithed at the committee level. So if this all feels like a lot, um, if you trust your HP funds committee members, there was, it was a very thoughtful like committee level review of this. Yeah, Jim uh, Meeker, I don't know if you want to say anything at this stage or. Um, well, we just finished going through the HP4 uh, excess allocation and there was 
uh, unlike the original application where we had more money than we had people requesting, for that little bit of residual we had left, that three million or so, we had a lot more requests than we had money to give out. So as far as reallocating this, it looks like these programs are finding ways to spend the money. So I'm confident that we'll be able to fully expend the money, not have to give anything back to the feds. Same. Um, there is a resolution on the screen in the, for the, in the sake of time, I will um, leave it to y'all to read it and entertain a motion to approve it. So moved. So Chris, you have a motion by Tammy and I will second. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Jeff. Shall we call rule? Yes. All Saraf? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Oglagi? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. King? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Vargas? I'm sorry, um, Milrod, was that, I, I put a yes, but did she, Patience, did you, is Patience still on? Vargas Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, thanks. Chris, seven two. Sure, that's, um, I'm sorry. Oh, that's you too, Jen? That's me yeah. too, yes. Okay. Uh, approved changes to homelessness prevention grant reporting. Okay, so I'll give a little background. Um, we'll discuss the proposed updates and then we have a resolution. Okay, so while analyzing the data and compiling the first annual reports for the HP2 and 3 grants, Staff noticed that support centers did not have many opportunities to report quantitatively on um, support center services to QLSPs because quantitative data mostly focused on services to indigent Californians. This means that some support centers appear to be doing much less work than they're actually accomplishing. The Homelessness Prevention Funds Committee recommends updating the reporting requirements for HP2, 3, and 4 grants in order to better capture the work of support centers, specifically outputs such as numbers of trainings, convenings, et cetera. The proposed changes would improve the completeness and precision of HP data, and by extension, reports to the legislature and public. These reports could make a stronger case for future funding for homelessness prevention legal aid. The major change, as you saw in the posted materials, is to add the following language to the reporting requirements. Quote, for support centers, quantitative and qualitative data about trainings, convenings, research, and other support for qualified legal services projects, end quote. Additionally, we have included minor changes which have not, uh, which have not been redlined because they're technical formatting changes, such as replacing Roman numerals with Arabic numerals. Um, and these technical changes reflect efforts to make the requirements in HP documentation more uniform. Uh, I'm going to recommend that we don't review each of the redline versions now and um, skip that. And next, I just have a resolution. But of course, I'm happy to go back if anyone wants to see the redline documents. Can I, can I just let's jump in yeah, there really quickly? Go ahead, Chris. So essentially, essentially, the way we run the reporting requirements through the commission, um, I suppose it's just stopping at the committee level. And it, it became very clear after looking at the HP um, uh, data sets that we've been getting so far that we're, we're getting great quantitative data about the services of QLSPs towards indigent Californians, but only very qualitative narrative data about the work for support centers towards QLSPs. And we realized when we were writing it up, it's when one has lots of quantitative data and the other one is kind of like abstract narrative data, it's really hard to visualize what the support centers are doing. So just having, throwing in some quantitative questions is almost to their benefit. So we can tell a compelling story about the impact that they're having. Uh, patience, then Efrain. Thank you, Chris. 
I'm really fast. Do you know whether or not did you confer with the support centers about what data they already co collect and uh, do they agree with you that this is a net going to be um, a benefit? I uh, I'm not sure what they already collect and what how whether this will be a new uh, and additional challenge for them. It's a great question, patients. And what we did is we I didn't actually have a formal touch point, but what we did is we just used the same categories of data that they have to provide on their annual. App, IOLTA application for support center funding. It's like how many instances of technical assistance, QSPs, convenings, and task forces, and we didn't add anything that we didn't think they were already collecting. Efrain? Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, sort of along similar lines to patients, just curious if as we're as we're contemplating this this new requirement, one, um, whether there's at all any process for the for grantees to let us know if if this, in other words, will this be additional administrative costs for them, and will they be able to recoup these costs now that we're asking them to? They may or may not collect the state. It sounds like they may collect it. I know that because these are federal dollars, the 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 available dollars for admin and uh, these type for collecting these types of data are very limited. So I'm just curious if they'll be able to tell you if they if this adds an additional cost or burden to them. I think that's a great question. Um, I'll I'll just say um, th there's a difference also between the admin that grantees do and what they budget for versus the admin that we as staff have, um, and the percentages such as five percent is actually for OA and I staff. Um, in terms of grantees, I'll, I'll leave that to Chris, but one thing I will say is if they did need to significantly increase their admin, they could always submit a budget revision request for that. They, yeah, they can bill the, 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 uh, to the grant the time it takes them to collect and provide us with the reporting data. We, so that, that we, they would still be able to do that here. If the, if the time went up, we would let them report that spending, I think. So I just do um, on Chris's point that they're already collecting this data. The, the one thing that they'll need to do additionally, though, they'll have to disaggregate it for this grant. So, so there'll be there'll be some more work in addition, um, even though the even though the information is collected. Just just to be fully transparent. Thank you, Dawn. Um, okay, shall we vote on the resolution? Is there a motion? I'll move. Thank you, Jim. Is there a second? I can second. Okay, thank you. Was that Erica? Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Go ahead, John. Asara? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Oglagi? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fight Master Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yes. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. King? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Vargas? Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer or Chris, I'm not sure who's. I, uh, yeah. yeah, this next one would be me. And I, if Duan, if you like, Christian, if you like, I can skip the slides and just do like a quick spoken because yeah. we've already kind of talked about this. So th there's yeah. no vote for this one. So um, just to put the commission on notice that what staff and the HP Funds Committee uh, proposed to do is um, take a look at the home, the Homelessness Prevention 3 grant spending this summer, which is what um, Jennifer was mentioning earlier, which is the halfway point for that award. It's a, it's a three-year award, so that's 1.5 years in. 
um, to, to see if it would make sense. The committee would recommend to the commission whether or not it makes sense to reallocate some of those dollars at the halfway point to maximize the, um, the chances of full spin down by the end of the grant period for these federal dollars, the very end of the grant period is December of 2024. Um, doing it at the halfway point kind of balances the need to give grantees a, a chance to try and spin down their dollars and project out if they think they'll have unspent funds. And then and then if they do project unspent funds to collect them and reallocate them and give everyone at least a year, if not a little longer to spend those. So there's no vote today. It's just to let you know that the staff and the committee are, are, are planning to look at those spending figures and come back to the commission this summer with a potential recommendation. I actually had slides for this, but there's no vote. So maybe I'll skip the slides and we can save the time for the resolutions you need to vote on. Unless anyone had any questions or wanted to add anything. The reason this came up is we looked at the first year spending data and uh, just to see how, how much of the very first um, of three payments, like how much the grantees had spent of their first payment. And um, there were like uh, 14, uh, 14 grants they were like under 50 percent and then for another 13 grants they were between 50 and 75 so essentially staff will work with those programs in particular to see if they can like pick up the spending and then assess like a, a structured reallocation mechanism over the summer and so that, that um this was posted this this report was posted in writing for today's meeting if you want to sit with the numbers but i think yeah. I'll, at that, I'll just turn it over now Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I would just it's echo that there's general consensus that this is like the approach to take, which is to try to reallocate money that's not going to be spent. So there's not a, a lot of controversy there. Um, thanks, Chris, for the abbreviated version. Uh, okay, we march on uh, partnership grant committee. Crystal and Eric. Yeah, I think. Um... Jason was going to take this one. Okay. Sure. Um, Jason, I can provide just a quick overview. And if you wanted to share sort of insights from the working group, um, would that work? Yep, that's fine. We'll okay. go quick. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, one second. Oops. Uh, so uh, I guess this is your third time hearing about our review process or for the budget revisions and carryover requests. Um, same thing, same thing um, echoing the process that uh, both Erica and uh, Jennifer went over. This is regarding the 2022 partnership grants. Um, as of the January 31st deadline, we received two budget revision requests, which were below 25%, and then four carryover requests received. And looking at the actual request that needed, uh, that needs to commission approval, there are only three requests um, submitted that were over 25%, which is what we'll be um, discussing today. Um, as a note, uh, there was a slight deviation in, in the process at its January 11th meeting, the Partnership Grants Committee delegated authority to an ad hoc working group comprised of Jason um, and Diana Cruz to review and develop recommendations on behalf of the committee. Uh, and um, I'll just quickly, I don't know if, if the committee would like more time. Basically, we received three requests uh, from Bethetic Legal Services for their various partnership grants, uh, ranging in carryover requests of 37%. Um, this, this is for their decedent's estate self-help clinic um, due to uh, unjusted staffing changes and delayed hiring um, issues. Uh, as well as a 38% request for the remote pro, pro se technology initiative. Um, again, um, hiring delays uh, for this project. Uh, and then finally, uh, their supplemental grant, it's 100%, but at $30,000 $30, for their PG 2.0 supplemental. Um, as a note, uh, and this was discussed uh, at, during the working group, uh, when we met uh, was Betsetic has does not have a history of carryover requests. This is the first time we've received it in the context of their partnership grants. So the working group felt confident that these funds would be uh, spent during the allotted six month period. Um, Jason, feel free to chime in if I missed anything. Yeah, the only thing I will add really quick, uh, like you said, the percentages are kind of large, but of the total value, which is fairly small, and giving the staffing rotation reason for the, the first two makes a lot of sense um, because that's the bulk of their expenditure. So the delay uh, is justified from our group. And then they have, there's a change in the law and they wanted to delay expenditure to make sure that the content they were preparing reflected the change in the law. So 
And if approved, the proposed resolution is on screen, uh, which is to approve the three uh, 2022 partnership and carryover requests um, submitted or received by Betzedic Legal Services. Catherine moves approval. Thank you, Catherine. Thank Take you. the words out of my mouth. I'll second that. Thanks, Bob Shame. I'll do roll call. Al Saraf? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Aglogi? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Yes. Will? I'm, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Campbell? Yes. Campbell? <laughs> Yes. Escobedo? Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? I need to recuse myself, so that's either recusal or abstention, however you want to note it. Okay. Thank you. King? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Like Eric, I need to abstain, recuse myself. Thank you. Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Vargas Shriver? Yes. Motion passes. Will, thank, thank you. you. Everyone. Thank you. Will, you're like LeBron. You can just go by a first name. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Chris, I just want to do a time check. Um, we have five minutes, and there yeah. are two, two agenda voting agenda items. So I don't know if you want. The uh, not vote, number 10 is actually a really quick report. Eric, I can, I can do that in probably two minutes. And then bank grant committee, I, I don't know if you want a PowerPoint presentation or the materials had um, a memo. Yeah, so I, I think it's up to general. I, I do, given the challenges of getting everybody together for purposes of voting, I would rather make sure we do the votes that we need to do, um, which, I think we just have one here, right? There's just one left, yes. Yeah, one so let's good. yeah, let's dig in um, and try to and see what kind of progress we can make in in the time we have remaining. We might go three minutes over here, so if you can bear with us, but go ahead. Okay, I'll share my screen and go really fast. This is to. Um, delegate authority to make the 2024 to 2025 bank grants. Um, really briefly, in 2015 and 2016, the State Bar received over $50 million from Bank of America and Citi um, in accordance with settlement proceeds known as, known as Bank Community Stabilization and Reinvestment Grant Funds. Um, since then, the Legal Service Trust Fund Commission has awarded several rounds of funding through formula and RFP processes, as well as planning grants. Um, to date, the commission has allocated over $46.96 million for bank grants. The most recent bank grants closed on December 31st, 2022. Um, the total amount of remaining funding is $4,758,503. The Bank Grants Committee proposes that approximately 5% of these funds, or $237,925, will be allocated to the State Bar for Grant Administration, consistent with administrative percentages for other State Bar grants. Um, and this means that $4,520,578 remains to be allocated for 2024 to 2025 bank grant awards. Um, I'm going to skip this slide, but basically the memo outlined um, that based on the committee's meeting calendar, as well as the committee's desire to participate more actively in drafting the RFP alongside staff, there's not enough time for the committee to recommend the 2024 to 2025 bank grant RFP and timeline ahead of the commission's next meeting on June 23rd. The committee therefore asks the commission to delegate authority to the commission to approve the art. I'm sorry. The committee therefore asked the commission to delegate authority to the committee to approve the RFP and timeline for the 2024 to 2025 bank grants. Um, this slide has yeah. the, the roles and uh, the timeline. Today, we're asking the commission to approve delegation of authority. On July 28th, the committee will approve the timeline, RFP scoring rubric, and reporting requirements. Um, staff will release applications on August 2nd. 
They will be due on August 30th, which gives applicants four weeks to apply. On September 11, the committee will calibrate the rubric and advise the scoring team. Uh, the commissioner staff team will score applications for about a month. Then the committee will recommend awards on October 27th. The commission will approve the awards on November 9th, and the grant period will start on January 1st. And all of these dates are obviously tentative to accommodate um, commissioner and staff schedules. And the delegation effort, just to be clear, the delegation is to approve the timeline. The delegation, not, yeah. I'm I sorry, the is. delegation is to approve the timeline request for proposals, scoring rubric, and reporting requirements okay. for the grants. You, okay, you, okay, got it, got it, got it. But right, the commission will back. still remain authority to approve the ultimate grant. So the committee will have yeah. a recommendation that will go to the commission in November to approve the grant itself. Exactly. So Catherine uh, motions to approve the resolution. Thanks, Catherine. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Becca. Oh. Thank you Eric. Yes. Quick on the buzzer. Um, okay, let's take a roll call vote. Al Saraf? Yes. Connolly? Yes. Aglagi? Yes. Ball? Yes. Fightmaster? Blakemore? Yes. Bushelli? Yeah. Campbell? Yes. Escobedo? Escobedo? Yes. Yes. Galkin? Yes. Iskin? Yes. King? Yes. Judge Klein? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Mahoney? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Milrod? Yes. Vargas? Schreiber? Yes. Motion passes. 401, all the resolutions are done. Um, we've got a rules committee report and liaisons, and that should just take a couple minutes, I think. But um, yeah, take it away, and then we'll, we'll wrap. With the Rules Committee, Eric and I have just a very brief update. As you all know, uh, we took to the Board of Trustees for the first time a composite, an aggregate of uh, several Rule Committee items, asked the, asked the um, Board of Trustees to send it out for a public comment period. That public comment period has gone back, and Erica will quickly um, review the substance of that. Sure. So um, <clears throat> we actually only received four comments um, in response, and two of them are in disagreement. One of them was not really um, germane to the specific rule changes. It was um, just somebody indicating that they would like the commission to consider opening up uh, to private practice attorneys who do a lot of pro bono work. Um, and then there was another comment that um, again, was not really on point for the rule changes. It was more of a, a criticism of, I think the provisionally licensed lawyer program. Um, and then the comments that we received in support, one of them was, um, a letter from LAC actually, which was um, providing really strong support and uh, background information for the board to understand the process that the Rules Committee and the Commission has gone through um, and the way that the legal aid community has been engaged throughout the process. Um, and we think that's probably why we actually received so few comments because there has been a lot of um, engagement and incorporation of that feedback uh, during the rule development phase. So. Um, <clears throat> given those comments, uh, we'll be taking this back to the Board of Trustees in May um, to recommend approval um, of the rule changes. Um, th and then I just also want to, um, there is a process um, that's going to change a little bit, the recommendation of um, several members of the Rules Committee, um, because in the last kind of process, we took to the ask the board to then send out public comment, and that's consistent with how all the up sub entities have done it. Um, the commission is uh, uh, has has more 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 authority than the other sub entities. Um, so the board has has um, executive staff of the state bar has allowed us to have the commission kind of initiate that formal public comment period. So we're going to cut out one extra step. So what will happen is the rules committee will still send to the commission its recommendation at that juncture, not the board, but the commission will then decide to send out for a public comment period that we, the staff will coordinate with the state bar kind of communications to run that. It's very, it's 
identical public comment period, but it, the triggering will be the commission and not the board of trustees. We'll collect the public comments. It'll come back to the commission for you all to consider, and then we'll package it all um, to the board of trustees, a public comment, as well as the recommendation. So we're gonna cut out a couple extra steps and it'll streamline it a little bit more. It, it'll be great for our programs and for us to be able to do that. Awesome. Yay, great. So yeah. happy. Thank, thank you, staff. No, thank you. Go rules committee. <laughs> um, all right. Last but not least, I think Melanie might have dropped off even. Yeah, and Melanie actually, um, she said that there, there was no update from the Judicial Council at this meeting. Okay. So, so just Selena. Yeah, with lack, just it's with Friday substantive after, comments. It's Friday afternoon. I'm staying between you, you and the break. I'll be very quick. Um, one update is actually co-update with Melanie. Um, we are planning to, again, do the Family Law Self-Help Conference. We haven't met in person since 2019, of course, um, but we're planning a conference later this year. So I'm just really excited because Judicial Council, LAC, and the State Bar have um, worked really closely on these conferences for, since, I think, 2003. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful we'll be able to see each other in person. And, and Melanie's looking at SoCal locations. Um, the other very quick update is the executive director retreat Rialta funded nonprofit EDs will be in April. Um, we'll be doing a retreat. It's an opportunity for people to see each other in person. And again, a lot of us haven't seen each other since 2019. And um, we're getting a lot of really great feedback on the registration process of people um, who are eager to meet and what they want to share. There's, as you all see, there's a lot of brand new executive directors and we want to bring them into our fold so everyone knows that they can um, reach out to each other for help. Um, and the last update is, um, oh, I also sit on the Shriver, so Shriver Grant Selection Committee. And an update from that committee is that this round of Shriver grants will end in October, sorry, on September 30th of 2023. And so all the evaluations of this last three-year cycle will be um, available. I think that Melanie or, or Laura had said in November, I think that this commission will be really interested in looking at, at that evaluation data. So when that is available, I'll make sure that Melanie or Laura shares it out with this group. And we've been talking about doing a convening of Shriver grantees that, that's open to the general public. And I think everyone here would be interested in, in all of these innovations and um, partnership with the court projects that we're testing for Shriver, which has been around now for, I think 2011 is when we started. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Selena. Uh, that's it for the agenda. These are jam packed. Um, Ephraim, patience. Thanks for uh, crossing the threshold here and uh, joining the commission. Thanks to everybody for being here, for all the committee work that you've done between these meetings and for the committee work you're all about to do. Um, so we'll be in touch soon. Uh, again, thanks uh, to staff as well for um, keeping us on point. And without further ado, I think that'll do it. We can cut off the recording and start eating. Thank you, see everyone. Everybody.